welcome back to another episode of Tuning In with Mark Claire Project. I'm your boy Jay Wells. I'm here with my man, Mixman Sean. Sean, say what's up to the people. What's up, people? We got a special episode here today. We got a very special guest. We've been waiting to have him on. It goes by the name of Seth Agress, also known as Sha Wan. Sha, what's up? What? What's up? Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. <clears throat> welcome to the show. Now, uh, what the people don't know is that we just got excommunicated by the 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 lords of electronics so this is take two we're gonna have a good time um sometimes technology throws a little bump in the road but i think one of the things that's interesting about the three of us is that we're familiar with technology and it doesn't rattle us too much so it's going to be a good conversation and um you know may they may the it lords bless us with a smooth uh process and recording and uh let everybody enjoy this good conversation so Troubleshooting is part of the game. <laughs> it sure is. One of the interesting things is um, when Sean and I started to come up with the idea of putting up the show, uh, we talked and you were definitely one of the people we wanted to have on, like as soon as we got rocking and rolling. Um, mostly Sean has, has of course, he'll, he's, uh, he holds you near and dear to his heart as a close friend. And um, interestingly enough, because he and I are close friends, I've kind of watched that uh, relationship and I've watched how you guys have uh, interacted throughout the years on and collaborated on things. So I'm super interested to hear your story, share your story, uh, let you share your story with the people and um, get this thing going, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, one thing I want to say though, I had a quote ready for you guys uh, before we got in here from Seneca it says, no man was ever wise by chance. And that's, oh. that stuck with me. Get, uh, getting into this week, just thinking about how how we pick our mentors, how we pick our friends, how our circle grows, and um, you know it's it, it's never accidental. It's always intentional. Like when you're trying to go the place that you really want to get to, so it doesn't surprise me that like Sean's like I'm ready to go get this interview in here, man. We got to have it because you know uh, of of what you've helped him do throughout the years and things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've we've both we've helped one another. Um, I've gotten a I've gotten a tremendous amount of knowledge from Sean. You know, uh, it's like a brother to me. You know. Hell yeah. And I think and I think to your point, what you say, uh, the Seneca quote. I think a big part of that, like gaining knowledge or becoming wise, right? A lot of it has to do with uh, not just experience, but being able being able to extract things that are valuable from that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if for you sure. If you don't extract any things from your experiences, then you're not really gaining wisdom. You're just going through those motions and experiencing those things, whether they be good or bad or neutral. That's right. Control. You don't learn the so, lesson along the way. Exactly. So you can be an old person and not be a wise person. You know? yeah, that's true. That's evidence every time I hit the road. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we all go through things, but I think um, one of the main uh, one of the most important things, which I try to teach my kids as well, is, you know, you will go through many and many experiences, some of them unexpected, some of them uh, difficult, some of them easy. But the most important thing is to be paying attention. Yeah, for sure. You have to be one of those people that pays attention. And, and I don't mean just like listening, but I mean, uh, like I said, extract things extracting lessons from those experiences but also um uh internalizing them thinking about mm -hmm. them. how does this affect me and the way i think about the world True. you know and not to go off on this whole tangent or anything but i, I love it that, that my connection to that with with mixman with sean is that you know like we've worked together on and off for many years mm -hmm. and some of those experiences have been amazing and some of them have, you know, taken unexpected turns that weren't so amazing. But yeah, for sure. they were all, when I look back on them, I was able to gather so much wisdom from all those things over the years. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good way of looking at things because, you know, it helps you stay in, t in tune with um, not just, just how your experiences are, but how your experiences are impacting others and making a collaborative um, experience of life, you know, we get traction yeah. together, you know, better than friction 
if we're going against the grain and, and recklessly kind of clashing into each other and things. I mean, you can figure out your lanes, um, hit your ride with each other, and, and you go in places, you know what I mean? For sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think if you're able to, <clears throat> I, I, I think, I mean, everyone's heard this before, but like, I believe different people are on different frequencies. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the best way to like explain it or try and visualize it. And I believe that if you can, um, if you know enough about yourself to be able to uh, raise or lower yourself in order to meet someone's frequency, then, right. you, then you can vibe with them, like, right? Like you can yeah. find common ground and you can learn from each other. And I think that's the best kind of relationship is like where you can get together with someone like you and I, like we, we're just now meeting, right. but there's a lot we can learn from just one conversation if we can like hit that same level, that same frequency. Yeah, you know I mean? no doubt. I think that's where a lot of conflicts happen in a lot of people's relationships too, because somebody's, um, uh, another term is volume, right? Like their frequency or their volume might be like, whoa, <laughs> overwhelming. So the other person's just like, yeah, I'm just going to, just going to kick back over here. And then so it's just the other person's just running the show um, or the alphas or whatever terms that they have and things like that. But it's interesting, man, because that sometimes can be a barrier to if you're the one doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Learning how to like, all right, let me turn this down and get on other people's level. Or if they're the one, it just takes experience. It takes um, understanding. And I, I like the term maturity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, for sure. Just hand in hand with wisdom. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, we get this wisdom all throughout our lives, but um, let's hear. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about your life and where you where you grew up. Uh, could you tell us uh, real quick before before we jump into that about your your name, the Shao One? You had mentioned uh, a little bit about it before. Where did that come from? Yeah, so <clears throat> that came about back in high school, uh, and <clears throat> so back in the days, um, actually in junior high, around thirteen years old. I start, mm -hmm. I got, I was always like a very creative kid. Mm -hmm. I was a, for the first 15 years of my life, I didn't have siblings. I was a single only child. Right, right. And I was raised by a single mother. So only 15 child. 15 years? For the first 15 years. Oh, dang. That's like so, a whole life. Yeah. So from birth to 15, I was an only child raised by a single mother. Mm. And um, so what that meant was. I spent a lot of time alone, right? Mm, I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. So I had in, in doing that, like there was a lot of times where it felt like torture. Like I would just be alone all the time. Mm. And um, if I wasn't at school or hanging out with my friends, you know, I'd just be alone. This was, this was pre-internet. I didn't have yeah. a phone that I could be on, you know, Instagram or TikTok or whatever. Yeah. The kids so, can't relate these days. Yeah, exactly. So this was, you know, pre-internet, um, and so I had to use my imagination. So I started drawing. Um, I got into music. I got into anything that had creative, kind of required creativity. Yeah. Um, and then I saw, I think one day I saw like this, uh, I saw this book on graffiti. Mm. And so I had, I had watched a couple movies on graffiti and breakdance. Like when I was a, also before that, I was in all the kids in my neighborhood were into breakdancing. Oh yeah, what so, about the movie Breaking? Mm. Yeah, Breaking and love know, that movie. Beat Street, like, Beat so Street. King. That's of the how Beat. old I am. Like I remember Beat Street and Breaking, <laughs> and uh, even Breaking Two. And uh, oh yeah, uh, that one's kind of sus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it got a little weird, but but all that stuff was very influential to me. And um, so graffiti was a big part of hip hop back then. Now, oh yeah. Now I don't know if they really are synonymous, but like back then it was it was, it was uh, breaking, it, it was rap, hip hop was basically three things. It was yeah. breaking, graffiti, and the music. Yeah, that's rap, true. Rap, like early rap music. Yeah. And I was into all three of them, and graffiti, like I just I don't know, man. Like something about it just really struck me, and I wanted to be like some of these graffiti artists that they would do what we call I don't know what they're called now because I don't do graffiti now but they call yeah. them burners. so they have wait what, what do they call them they call them e either pieces or burners the big mm. murals you see like on trains and stuff 
Yeah, I didn't know that about that. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's what they were called. So we used to call them uh, pieces or burners. Uh, so, hmm. so I I got this book on on burners or pieces, right? And yeah. It basically was all the subway trains in New York, and it had all these beautiful pieces on the trains, right? They just bomb the hell out of these trains. Yeah. They, they call it bombing. So they would bomb the hell out of these trains. They would they would get their spray cans, you know, sneak into the train train tracks at night and bomb mm -hmm. these trains. And the next day, the trains would ride through the city with these big, beautiful, colorful. Legit. That's like the that's like their release. Like, yo, here's our premiere. Boom! And the whole the whole was, wagons full of it. That's badass. Yeah, it was badass, and they were like promoting themselves. So you would have your name. Mm. You would you come up with an some kind of name that you went by it's like your street your tag basically yeah yeah your tag and, that's what i remember the taggers yeah that's what they called it yeah. yeah and so me and my uh my homie who uh lived down the street uh we started getting into like tagging yeah and i had a bunch of tag names but i settled on shop because mm -hmm. it was my initials sha but yeah. i did the one because in those days again i don't know if they're still doing this but like a lot of tags would be like whatever your name was and then you put a one on it because you're ah. you're claiming it you're like I'm the one you Bro, know it's yeah it's like uh it's like in Twitter you're verified it was your blue check mark yeah. so I'm not, I'm not shot 2 I'm not shot <laughs> three. fuck those guys I'm shot 1 hell yeah no hell that's yeah. legit that's legit I I never yeah. even realized that so other other graffiti artists were putting one at the end of their tag so they can claim like they're the official legit one at only. least, at least back in those, the one. The, this was in the nineties. Uh, they well, probably say him now, right? I am him. <laughs> he, she, her, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Whatever their pronouns are. They, they, them. Yeah. So there might be a shot they out there. But oh, there's there's only one, one shot one. You know? <laughs> um, that's legit. Yeah, yeah. Segway. That's, uh, that's how I got that name. And no, then, that's badass. You know, I just, people to this day, like my man mix man over here yeah. still shot one. Which, Oh, that's, that's cool, man. That's how I met you. Like, that's I, how you uh, met him? I didn't meet I didn't meet Seth for a minute. Yeah. yeah. I met him, bro. You'll you'll connect to this. Okay. How I know Shah. By the way, people in India think his name is Shah. Like a Shah, like a Badshah, like a king. The king. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I get into that later. But how I met him, we know the same person that's responsible for us. You remember Asher from our school? Asher? Yeah, Asher, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember Asher. All right. So me and you were working at Safeway, right? We're both that's doing our shit after school. This is like bagging Safeway. groceries like a motherfucker. Bro, fucking bagging groceries, you feel me? And um, pushing carts. <laughs> Code seven? Code seven. <laughs> Uh, on aisles, oh, uh, on aisles. Yeah. yeah, clean that shit up. <laughs> so you, he, so no, Asher, Asher was the guy, huh? Yeah, bro, I'm over there just bagging groceries and fucking all of a sudden, and this is like summer break, and we're we're doing our shit, we're doing the music and the marketing thing. Yeah, and um, uh, and I'm listening to DMX, random ass shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like Eric, me and Rakim, we're we're doing our thing that we did, right? And then. Fucking like Asher pulls up and he like, cause he knew was, I'm like I'm Punjabi like I'm I was the only other kid besides him. Oh really? And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And Dave. Oh, and Dave, yeah, can't forget about Dave. From, but he's totally a different type of Indian than me. He's yeah. the other side, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> he's East, but like we love Dave, you know. Yeah, yeah, he's still family. Oh, of course, no, but so Asher pulls up on me. He's like, yeah, well. You listen to rap music i'm like of course like oh man he's like yo check out this cd this is uh this is my cousin mm. and he'd be rapping in our language you know what i mean yeah asher don't even speak Punjabi, but he he had a bunch of this little cds and he um so i keep it was the same moment we were over there at, at the fucking safe he gave me the cd i was like cool my first impression i'm like I look at the graphics and I look at the graffiti. Mm. I own the shit. So my first 
fucking impression was like, holy fuck. This is a movie poster. This is right. back in 2000, 2099. <laughs> it's Adobe 2. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was it? Photoshop yeah. 2 or whatever? <laughs> but hella Layers. good. It was like, yeah. it, it was done hella good, bro. Yeah. And, um, and Shaw was like the, the graphic guys behind it because like, bro, you got to look at his, his work is really fucking, yeah. It, it's, it's intense. Well, it's, well, it's hopefully, if you got a couple of things, uh, send it our way. We'll post it on our, our show and stuff, our show notes and, um, our socials and YouTube and things to incorporate with the, with the check. release and stuff. People can check it out. No, okay. so, so bro, I, I'm looking at the CD. Just, to, I haven't even heard it yet. I'm just looking at the, the backgrounds and the pictures. It mm-hmm. looks like one of the fucking DMX CDs. Yeah. It looks, and I'm like, it, it's, this is like, it's crazy. It was really street. It was hella dope. It was hella graffiti. It was hella hip hop. I go home and I, and I pop it in my fucking CD player and I, I start recognizing the language. Yeah. Off of, and it was the beats. Hella good, bro. And a couple of the songs were pretty good. Shaw was on the hook. Mm. That was the best song on it. <laughs> something, something, Gator Shoes. I don't. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're on the yeah. hook. That's that's a fly. I mean, uh-huh. the whole. It, it was a vibe. It was hella dope. And uh, how did that feel for you too, Sean? Because, uh, I, I mean, even before you connect the dots, like when you hear. Cause you like hip hop, but you probably didn't hear it too often in your own language. Bro, I, I connect in a whole nother way. Mm. Yeah, cause you know I, we were all into hip hop like crazy, cause we felt oh, yeah. it. But my thing was language. But when I heard it in like my own language that I understood, uh-huh. I was like, oh, I can't believe there's other fools like out there like doing. Yeah, that's a game changer. That are local to me. I was like, what? And um. So Asher leaves me with that CD and, and it has like Shaw's number, homie's number, and like <laughs> we just put our phone numbers in email. <laughs> yeah. That's your marketing scheme right there. Oh, yeah. yeah, no matter of fact. Straight out the trunk like E40. I have I have that same CD on me. I, I bet mean, you I'm, do. I'm gonna pull it, yeah, I'm gonna pull it just for this because You brought it for the show? Uh, special. Yeah. Special I move. No, original, original copy. That's so. legit. <laughs> yeah, we would that was uh interesting man uh we we can go into that yeah for that sure was, how did you um, get into that how did you get into the uh music making and and uh selling cds like that so we were uh man i mean i don't know how far you want to go back like we can this this was the cd that uh asher handed me like yeah oh okay i got Shout you i got you got the inside is it is it yeah, um, the inside unfolded, and um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> there's yeah. uh, that's the that's us right there. That's oh yeah, see, I, I remember seeing this. Yeah, seen, yeah, seen this before. Legit, legit. So that that um sort of graffiti style writing, and even the graphics on here. Um. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was this was all this was all. You know. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead because we can yeah, talk, yeah. About this, but that was basically, you know, I put together a bunch of different, we did a photo shoot in my apartment mm. you know, and then and we, you know, I put together a bunch of different options for us, you know, because we were like a team, we yeah. called ourselves the outfit and then yeah. we, we settled on that one and that one had like my, um, of fact, sort of my style of, of tagging, like, you know, a, a lot of different what you call writers or taggers, they have their own styles. Yeah. And, and that was right there was kind of like my style. I, I actually, it, I kind of mixed um, sort of like that New York subway tagging style with the West Coast, like um, Mexican tagging right. style. I was right. really into that, like this certain type of ease that looked like threes almost. And then mm. they use a lot of like sharp corners with like rounded bottoms and stuff like if you're in, I'm sure you're, because you're down in like the LA area, you see that yeah. all over the place. Like, they got all kinds of stuff all over right now. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you pull up on any, anything, it's got something going on. Right. But even this town of San Pedro, beyond beyond tagging and graffiti, 
values that kind of street art. They have murals all over the town. Like yeah. every electrical box has some kind of cool ass art on it and shit. You would you would like it if you like this kind of stuff for sure. You'd appreciate the way this town does it. Bro, but, it, yeah, take us back a little bit, actually, Shaw. Take us back in time a little bit uh, before you even got into music. Tell us a little bit more about your your uh, your childhood a little bit before we uh, kind of circle back into how you got to making CDs and and uh, putting together you know photo shoots in the in the apartment and everything. Let me let me finish real quick before. before. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. I'm, I'm gonna let you finish. <laughs> no, no, no. So, bro, I'm already impressed off of the graphics and the music, though. But like, mm. nowhere on the album it said like Shah designed the whole. Thing. Like, oh right. It was just like, this is this is what he does, bro. He creates like shit that people can't create. You know what I mean? Right. And the, I knew him from the music because there was, there was songs about him, you know, Sha One, like hella shout outs. So I thought, I just knew him from the music. I found out he does the graffiti and the graphics and this crazy visual shit later. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like he does overall hella creative shit. Like even the chords he played on the album weren't regular. That's why I was a fan of it. I yeah, was, and stood and, out to you. Yeah, so when I, I when I found the music, then I found the people, because that's what I was doing. I was yeah. going to the shows. I was, you know, me. I was always out and about to a different show because I was doing my stuff, DJing yeah. and what. And then they were performing as the outfit at at, at some venue. I pulled up, got in touch with them, and uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, for sure. That's how you DM someone back in those days. You actually yeah, no doubt. pull up and you walk up to them and shake their hand. That's, yeah, that you was pull up, back. introduce yourself. Yeah, my thing was like that. In real life, IRL. Exactly. Yeah, because I made beats. So I was like, we both made beats, right? So I put like all my beats on a CD. I was like, I'm going to go to the show and see if they want to work with me. And I just exchange music with them. And that's how that started. No doubt. And then when I met Shaw and and, you know, we I was started working with them, and that's that's when I met Seth like later on. But for the <laughs> yeah, long yeah. time, I was just like I was so I, I was I met I met Dr. Dre to me, like you know, <laughs> there's something on the CD like I want, and then you meet the person, you're like, oh shit, bro, you made that beat. <laughs> like, so you were geeking out. Yeah, dude, because we we make beats, but like not shots like classically trained, like his. The way he makes beats versus how I make beats is different process. It's, it's just a different path to the same outcome. Like you make some dope ass beats. <laughs> My shit snaps, but the shit you make, bro, it's um, I don't know. It's something else. <laughs> it's tight. <laughs> it's but um, you you had to start somewhere though. You didn't just start out. It didn't no just ball. start out slapping. But but on the second album, me and Shaw got in the studio and and got. Mm-hmm. Together. Mm. Yeah, we can let's get into that. And uh yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, no. no, so um I mean, yeah, there is definitely a that was a that was definitely like I didn't just wake up one day and knew how to do that shit. Mm-hmm. Um so like I like I was saying, um spending a lot of time just isolated, you know. Yeah. Um you know, my mom would be off somewhere. Uh, I'd be home alone, just me and the dog. And I'd be like, I, I had, pian- I had a piano there, you know, yeah. and I had our, uh, you know, I had pens and paper. So I would just create stuff constantly. Right. And it, just, it, it trained my brain to think a certain way. Like I think of everything from a creative, um, approach. Right. You know? Um, and when I say creative, I mean like, I mean, bringing, I mean, taking uh, an idea from your mind. It's like it only exists in your mind. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Right. And figure out a way to expel that from your head and turn it into something real that you can share with the world. Yeah. It's like sculpting a, a, or painting a blank canvas. It, to everybody else, it just looks like nothing's on there. But in your mind, you already know 
what you're going to paint. So you get there, whatever your tools are and you make it happen. Yeah. yeah. Or you just kind of get in that, um, that flow of things where you just kind of let it, you're, you're like a vessel. Like you just, you're, you're just letting that, um, creative energy flow through you out onto that canvas. You mm-hmm. know, you're not thinking about anything. You're not, you're not, um, you're in the moment. You're not focused on the past or the future. You're just in the moment, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I spent a lot of time like that as a, ch- as a kid. Um, and, uh, and you're in Oakland, right? It was, so I, I live my, the, so the first few years of my life, I lived in, uh, Berkeley and West Berkeley, mm-hmm. which, um, at that time was very different. It's now yeah. it's like Berkeley uh, Berkeley gets slammed a lot because it is, you know, sort of like the, the far left liberal woke city, mm-hmm. like way they bear woke. That, they bear the torch of that. <laughs> they bear the torch. Yeah. Um, and it's always been, Berkeley's always been sort of like this, um, you know, like they've been the land of, you know, like they've, they've been, they've, they've been a place where they protest things that they um, believe are, you yeah, know, since the sixties, uh, since like the <laughs> Vietnam era. Yeah, it was like that the time frame and all that stuff. But that was a different time. Um, you know, the like the, the hippie movement and all that stuff. That was a different time. It wasn't like um, it wasn't where they were trying to like prove somebody wrong. Mm-hmm. And like, you're right, you're wrong. Is where they were trying to actually make a statement that they believed right. in, like civil rights. Things yeah, that, something actually, that had a moral uh, construct to it. Yeah, things that actually were important and impactful and could potentially move our our, our uh, civilization forward, right? Yeah. But that's like, anyways, when I was there in the 90s, Berkeley was going through this weird thing where um, it was just like, in like in West Berkeley, it was just a lot of, it was just weird, man. Like there was just mm-hmm. said, like graffiti everywhere. There was trash everywhere. There was like, prostitutes and you know uh drugs and everything hotels and it was kind of like that's how a lot of the bay area was at that time yeah the east bay now that you drive through that same area it's all like uh brand new uh college apartments built for college students or like you know uh little little two two bedroom homes that are selling for like 1.2 million dollars five mil because you have a view of the golden gate and shit I spent, I lived there and then I also lived in um, Oakland, Richmond, Hayward, yeah. kind of all over the, that part. Yeah, I remember your apartment from Oakland off, yeah. of, off of Broadway. I used to love on you back Yeah, then. yeah, for sure. So the East Bay, like East Bay is yeah. my, you know, that's that's my home. But, no um, doubt. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. Unique place. Was, yeah, yeah, it's definitely unique. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so like I, from there, I, um, you know, I so I started learning um, classical piano, um, like taking so classes I, or uh, learning. Like, on, how would you learn? I had a teacher, oh, and, did you? and so I learned piano, and um, this was like I started at around four and a half years old. Mm. And by the time I was like, it, it turned out that I was pretty good at it. And mm. um, <clears throat> shit, legit. By the time I was like, um, <laughs> you know eight or nine i was playing like pretty complex mozart pieces uh you know uh mozart chopin um schubert schumann bro you can Arizona. hear that on the album you can hear that on the yeah. album my, my mind was blown because i was playing the fuck out of that keyboard yeah i love well, it i i i got pretty good and like i got to this point where mm. this school which was called the crowden school of music mm. it's, it's still a very prestigious music school and they offered me it was a very expensive school but they offered me basically to go there because they auditioned me and the, and the the principal who was ann crowden who's the founder of that school yeah. she's, she died a long time ago but she was the founder of that school she was like uh would you like to attend this school and i'm like 10 years old at that time yeah uh, and you know my so my this was around the time when my my dad and my mom and dad were they had split up. So he mm. he had bounced, but he was still coming in and he was still uh, you know a part of my life. So yeah, 
he's like, I think you should do this, you know. So I started attending that school and I started thriving like musically. Like mm. I was just learning, like my music skills went from, you know, here all of a sudden way up here. Like I'm getting really right. like becoming a skill, skilled musician, but I'm only 10 years old. I'm still a right. kid. So all I want to do is run around with my friends and play outside. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. As I think while you're explaining this, I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm thinking about what I was like when I was 10 and like, what was a day in the life like going to a school like that? So you would go to, okay, from what I recall, all right, well, so here's the weird thing, man. That school, I, like the kids I, where I was, um, like when we would play outside, we'd be rough housing. Yeah. We'd be stealing from 7-Eleven up the street. Mm-hmm. Just to go down to Taco Bell and like um, when we were hungry, we would go down to Taco Bell down the street and then we would wait for someone's number to be called and we would we'd be like, oh, <laughs> Number, number 20? Oh, yeah, that's me. These little kids that can barely... <laughs> the statue of limitations isn't up on that, man. We're going to have to delete this part. <laughs> and we would take it, and then we'd go eat it behind Taco Bell. It'd be like a mystery box. We're like... Oh, <laughs> that's the kind of shit we were doing, but all the kids at um, at Crowden cool. School were all these little, like... They really weren't doing that. They're, like, hella sensitive. I got into a lot of trouble there. So, like, yeah. I would get fights. I would, I would be, like, we would, we would, you know, I would say some, give some kids some like your mama joke, right? And then right. he was crying and then go <laughs> tell the teacher. So you weren't fitting in. No. Yeah. So a day in the life for me was like, um, I just fell out of place, you know, no and, um, and I would always get in trouble and um, you, they were, but they were teaching us like pretty high level stuff, like, um, you know, high level math stuff. I mean, for high level for a for an eight, nine, and ten year old. Yeah. So you so you still had all the academics, and but music and, was like a major thing there. Yeah. So you would spend a lot of time. You know, my instrument was piano. There was only two piano players in the whole school. Wow. And you know, there was like a bunch of uh, violinists and cellists and people with uh, brass instruments and right. drums, etc. And I was pianist, and so like they would go hardcore with you. They'd be like. You know, play it over, play it again, play oh, it again. Shit. You know, and um, but you know, at ten years old, you just kind of do what you're told. Like you don't question things. At least I didn't. I just kind of right. did what I was told. So, and then they actually had me learn the viola too, which is a it's kind of like a, a bigger it's a violin. small smaller or bigger violin. I, I think it's bigger, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I it's don't got know. five strings, I think. Mm. Anyways, they had me learn that, and like it was just all focused on music. Yeah. But the, but this was also, like I said, at a time when my dad was leaving. So mm-hmm. My dad was moving out of the house. He had a different, you know, girl. And, you know, I was with my mom and my mom, she had a lot of health problems. Mm-hmm. So, like, I was, you know, and of course, I'm going to be like, you know, little mama's boy. Like, I'm like, I'm staying with her. I'm going to rock with my mom. Right. And so I was going through some weird mental shit. Um. And I was getting in fights with these kids who would like start crying and go run and tell a teacher. And so one day I drop a, I brought a, a ninja. I was really into ninjas. Hell and yeah. My next door neighbor who's, um, I'm half Japanese. He was also half Japanese. So we used to call each other brothers. Mm. And he, he like had all these fucking ninja weapons and shit, like actual <laughs> metal ninja stars and like ninja nunchucks and all this shit. But it was like, <laughs> real weapon. it wasn't plastic. It was like flea market shit. Bang. I don't know how he got these things. And <laughs> he gave me a ninja star and I brought it to school, to this music oh, shit. Store, right? And I'm showing all the kids. I'm like, check this out. I'm throwing it into the wall. <laughs> it into the wall. And the kids are just like looking like their eyes are all wide and shit. They're like, they don't know how to, they're like, what the fuck? And I thought they were enjoying it. So I kept doing it. It was like sticking in the wall, leaving all these marks. And then one of the kids, after I, after like the bell rang or whatever, went and told the principal. Damn. And then I got expelled. Snitches get out. stitches, bro. I know. And um, <laughs> that's a real ninja. So shit I right got here. expelled from the fucking school for doing and, ninja shit, bro. And then um, <laughs> Yo, they expel you on the slip. Is doing too much ninja shit. Too much ninja <laughs> shit. And like, uh, what was it? So that kind of was like the beginning of the 
the end for me because I I started thinking I started looking at music in a different way at that point. Mm. How did um, it shift? What was the shift that you that changed? What were you looking at it before versus afterwards? Well, before, like I said, I was just doing it without questioning it. Yeah. But I like I wasn't in touch with my feelings, right? I was just doing it. But, oh, understood. But the the crazy thing is when I would play, I would feel really good. Like, yeah, yeah. I, to it. I was one of those little kids you see on like YouTube or something where they're like rocking back and forth and they're like yeah, yeah. Their own world and shit. I was doing that shit. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how healthy that was for me. Yeah. Yeah. And so after that incident and then, you know, my dad leaving, so he doesn't ha he can't control me anymore because he's not in the house anymore. Right. And I mm -hmm. want to be out with my friends when I'm practicing. I hear all my friends playing in the streets. I'm like, mom, I want to be out there. She's like, no, you can't. And then I realized, you know what? She can't tell me what to do. She's just this little Japanese lady. <laughs> That's the problem for the old, the all the single moms out there. When the boys realize, yeah, that you... <laughs> the thing happened at once. It all converged. Damn. And I I told her I want to quit piano. Oh shit. And I quit, and she's like, "You're gonna regret this someday." Said, how did how did she feel? Was she really upset? Like she didn't show me. She didn't show it, but I'm sure she was very upset. And oh yeah. I, I actually recently found a letter from my teacher and my teacher was like, um, from piano. Yeah. And oh, she's shit. like, I don't even remember seeing this letter, but she wrote it to me and she's like, you know, I know you're going through some stuff right now, but I really hope that you decide to stay because you have something special. And, and I, I don't even remember getting that letter. Damn. Right. But now I see it and I'm like, oh, you know, like that's crazy. But yeah, so, yeah. Like, like that person believed in you, bro. That person yeah. believed in you. You know what I mean? Like the, an, an adult doesn't write that to a kid without right. like really seeing something from their adult eyes. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty dope, though. So, anyways, that's how I got into music, man. Um, Damn. Yeah. Bro, if I'm not mistaken, your uh, your mom was trained too, right? No, my mom. Uh, she was never trained, but she um, the piano that I grew up playing was her piano as a kid. So oh. she. She comes oh. from a big family, like a big Japanese American farm farmer family, like they're farmers, oh, really? and they had like nine brothers and sisters and big family, you know. And Damn. so she, her thing was like she would just play the piano all the time, even though she wasn't trained. Yeah. And, and so she gave me that piano, which I still have, which I gave to my kids. That's legit. That's, Keep that it in the family, family, man. And bro, you don't have to be trained. Some people just have it. No, no, you don't have to be trained. My daughter, man, she she refuses to get a teacher, but she plays some of the songs that I played when I was like an advanced Jeez. that I had to learn. Yeah. But I I kind of show her, and then she figures out the rest, and she's able to right. do it. And I'm right. really impressed by that. And, but she yeah. refuses. I've hired teachers, and then she's like, I don't like doing it. So yeah, she learns on her own. You know. Yeah, that's interesting. It's just, it's something about. There's something uniquely, I think everybody has some creativity in some capacity, but like, it seems that things like this, like music is kind of a, almost a, I don't want to say that it's passed on through, you know, genetics, but maybe a combination of like your natural uh, skills that you have uh, or your, your affinity to so like you're drawn to it or you're you, you may be capable of that off the, the cuff just to kind of jump right into it just because of your genetic makeups but like then there's the environment right like like you said your mom come from a, a farming family but that piano was there so she was her purpose was to play that but because she kept it and she gave it to you now you had that access and that opportunity and the chain continues and sean his family i know we talk about his uncle and shit all the time, kind of be put him on music. I had guitars and stuff around my house because my mom and her boyfriend and things. So it's just like, is it circumstance or is it like part of the plan? Like the bigger plan. It's an interesting way that this happens for people. You know, I just find it trippy as hell. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, um, I think a lot of it is, you know, like, uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, um, outliers he talks about this it's on a different mm. level he talks about people that are like extremely rare like a bill gates or elon musk right their accomplishments but he talks about how or like steve jobs how the stars kind of align but some of it is yeah like your 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 genetics 
maybe the way your brain works, you know, um, but mm-hmm. also the circumstance. Like, for example, you know, I had that access to that piano. Had I not had a piano in the house, I would have never figured out that, oh, I'm pretty good at this, you know? Yeah. Um, Bro, and you're growing up right there when Tupac actually can open his rep. Yeah. Too I short mean, is right I was, there. Yeah. Like, I was, I was, producing like the. Well, yeah, and music was changing. Obviously, it it, it uh, favors people like us that are, you know, we don't have, I guess you would say, uh, an interest in this technology. You can be your own. You can create on your own. You know, like how Sean met Asher and Asher passed him a CD. Well, 10, 15 years before that, that ain't happening at all, you know. Nowadays, it's even easier because it's like, subscribe to my channel. <laughs> All that, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's almost too easy now. Yeah, it's and there's a, an abundance of it. I think that's what kind of led me to that that discussion is that like everybody has this creative side, but now people are uh, using technology on a daily basis, and it's like infused with our way of life. It's become our part of our like cultural norms to just jump on here. Oh, I'm gonna share this story real quick. Oh, let me put this graphic on it. Mm-mm-mm. It's not easy. Like Canva. Have you got have you guys used Canva before? Yeah. yeah, that's how I do graphics now because it's just so easy. But I'm also like capable of using a little bit more complex tools. But why the hell am I gonna do that? Right, right. right? Well, yeah, yeah then, exactly. Do you use <laughs> What's that? Do you use mid journey at all? No, I've never used Mid Journey. Um, if I do need to use something more complex, I just have Affinity on my computer. It's kind of like Illustrator. Yeah, Mid Journey will blow your mind, dude. That's oh, uh, AI. So oh yeah, just put in your prompt, and it's it's kind of it's kind of scary because <clears throat> you can put in your prompt like um, you know uh, you could put in something like you know. Um, Give me a give me a photograph of a beautiful village in Punjab at midnight with you know like uh, white flowers growing and mountains in the background, right? Yeah. Take the photograph with this Nikon camera right here. Mm-hmm. Put that all in the prompt, and it will generate the most amazing image that you just described, and yeah. it looks and it generates that image in thirty seconds. Imagination. And it gives you four. It gives you four options, and then within yeah. the four options, you can up. You can either upscale it to a big high res image, right. or you can like have it give you more versions of one of those. So it's yeah. like, and it does that for you. So like I love that's, it. Yeah, but it's 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 cool, but it's kind of scary because like that's the type of thing that would would have taken a graphic designer with using only Photoshop forever. <laughs> hours to make right to, or more bro yeah. bro it used to take you months to to master the pen tool the yeah pen. any of those things Whack-a-mole. oh i love ai yeah. it, it it is scary but it is interesting yeah, like i've been experimenting uh, alongside of this podcast as an experiment as well of just um you know, we did our last song that we did i used an ai app to prompt each little mini scene uh, of uh, the idea was my dog kind of inspired the, the, uh, the idea of the song. And so I wanted to have the theme of the video to be a dog. So I typed in, no, no, I want a dog running down the street. And then we were <laughs> drinking coffee and we were talking about astronauts and space and shit. So it turned into the dog gets in a fucking rocket, goes to space, goes all around and comes back to earth. And if you watch the video and you see that, you can see that it was me typing all the transitions yeah. in it. And then it would transition from one to the next thing. I love playing with AI. All of it's good. What's your favorite AI tool that you've played with so far? Uh, I think mid journey. Yeah. Yeah. What I are mean, some other ones that you've a, messed with? Uh, I've tried, uh, what's the other one? Uh, it's kind of like mid journey. I'm blanking on it, but it's um, it's very similar. It's like an image generating. Mm. What is it called? Go, go, um, w- not Wally. That's the fucking Disney cartoon. <laughs> it's um, it's like Gaul or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's probably the one I'm trying to think of. But 
I, I mean, I just stay with Mid Journey. I've tried um, Chat GPT's version of uh, they have like next generation AI as well. Um, but every, I mean, I'm embracing it. Like, yeah, it, it is scary, but like I'm embracing it. I think I've always been one that embraces technology, and yeah. and it's always a little scary because we're sort of walking through. We as consumers are sort of like feeling our way through the dark, right? Yeah. I mean, at least me, I'm not the one programming this stuff, but like, so I don't know. I just see the finished product or the iterative uh, yeah. version, and, and I'm just like, we're the like, end users. We uh, shit, man. We I, we we were driving. I have a Tesla. We just went to eat, yeah. and uh, the Tesla drove us there. I didn't even yeah. drive. I just yeah. I told it to take us there, and the shit drove us there. It's like that's where we're going, you know. It was really funny. I we were with somebody else the other day in a tesla and um i asked him about that because you have do you have the fsd yeah so you pay the subscription how does that work so i actually don't pay the subscription because yeah. uh it's a so even your buddy every tesla owner this gets a free month of test of fsd yeah. um and so i'm using my free month to see like, how I it is about a week ago and i haven't driven anywhere I'm a passenger in my own car. <laughs> That's scary. Like, I forgot how to drive, bro. I'm just <laughs> driving. It's yeah. crazy. Like it, at first, I used it, and I was very critical of it. I'm like, why is it going in this lane instead of that lane? Why is it taking so long to 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 get off? You know, to get ready to get off the exit. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, I'm like, man, this thing is really amazing. Like, yeah, it, it's not there yet, but it's it's got some flaws, but it's very close. It still tells you to like keep your hands on the wheel, though. You know, it, right? It Doesn't it tell you that? It, it does tell you, I believe there's like a waiver that you have to okay where it says, you know, you are ultimately responsible. Yeah. Which means, right? But I think because of NHTSA, which is National Highway Safety, whatever mm -hmm. um, association, they require it to like every maybe one minute or so, it flashes this little thing that reminds you to, to put your hands on the steering wheel. So I just squeeze yeah. this, I just go like this. So it knows. But you don't have to be like holding the steering wheel the whole time. It's not the same as like if you're driving. It's just like be ready in case the shit like you need it. It's literally taking you where you want to go. It's your chauffeur. Like you don't. Yeah. I, I see a future in which um, most people don't drive. Would you um? Do would you think that it would require? Do you think it would require every vehicle to be full self drive, or majority? I yeah, feel like so, people would fuck this up. <laughs> well, you're always going to have people that want to drive. And as right. long as you just have people that want to drive, Bro. you're going to have people that cause accidents, right? No doubt. And break the rules and stuff. But I think the part of the, the development of FSD on the, on, from Tesla's perspective is they mm -hmm. know that. Right? They understand that. So they're developing it to work in conjunction with these yeah. bad things out there. So And with weird random stuff that that comes about like for example if a fucking rabbit runs out in front of your car yeah the car needs to know what to do right yeah don't slow down kill right. fucking peter cottontail's gotta go bro oh, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he's gone whoops <laughs> you know it's uh but all of these things really fascinate me i mean yeah, this no is doubt. we're at the edge of technology and i think you know tesla since we're talking Tesla, like they are leading the way and people don't realize that, man. Like people who are not paying attention to this stuff yeah. are really, they don't, they only, like, they only pay attention to the Elon Musk memes and what they hear on Joe Rogan. They don't really dig in and like ask these questions. Uh, I've noticed. Yeah. And I'm kind of glad they don't because I feel like, um, it, it, it keeps me kind of like ahead of the curve. <laughs> you know what well, I mean? No, I agree. Or underestimating Tesla and Elon Musk, you know. I agree with that 100%. And uh, in before we got ready to record, um, you know, you, that was one of the things that you had mentioned that had been on your mind, just, you know, Tesla is a company that you admire, Elon Musk is a, as the CEO, what he does. Does it extend beyond just Tesla? Are you, uh, do you follow his other endeavors such as like, um, you know, SpaceX and, um, and of course, X itself, formerly known as Twitter, RIP. Yeah, I think Elon Musk is, <clears throat> he is one of the most important human beings alive. Yeah. And I know people hate him 
a lot of people hate him. And I understand because most people are not going to take the time that I've taken to actually really dig deep and learn about him as an individual or about his companies, how they are run. Yeah. But I think um, in the future, history will talk about him the way they talk about Thomas Edison or Albert Einstein or these people or like um, Gutenberg who invented the printing press in the 1600s. Yeah. They're going to talk about him. He's going to be on the same shelf as those guys in history in, when history tells yeah them. no because doubt his, his little tweets about like this or that you know uh you know uh you know shitting on the left uh, it's left. the politics i think that's now starting to really piss people off right and, it, and it, sometimes i'll read it and i'm like man because i'm a stockholder right so i'm right like, yeah are you tweeting that but you know, and i think ultimately it doesn't fucking matter this dude yeah is who cares really what he thinks politically and as far as his businesses like Neuralink, Tesla, mm -hmm. um, SpaceX. Yeah, Neuralink. Neuralink's the one that I forgot to mention but that one creeps me out the most. <laughs> and you yeah. got, so that's five major companies. Grok. Oh right, then you got Grok. Uh, yeah, that's Grok's there. like part of X is or something though but or is it its own thing? I'm not sure. Sean, you heard of Grok? It's, it's like chat GPT, but it's Elon version. Right. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a very significant human being, whether you like him or hate him there, that doesn't matter. That's, that's irrelevant. Why do people, I don't understand why people hate him. Like he's like, I don't know if macho man was a nerd and like, um, I'm a wrestling fan. So macho man's my guy. But he was like really well spoken for uh, you know somebody who was coked out and on steroids. <laughs> he probably wasn't on steroids, but maybe later. But like his energy, you know, like he comes in with a plan. The things that uh, they said about Macho Man was he was always prepared. He had like sixty-five moves that that he, if you were gonna do a match with him, you had to be on his page. And I feel like Elon's like that in in like real life shit. He's like got a plan for everything. He's really ready to speak. Um, he believes in free speech, like the most recent stuff with uh, going on with Brazil and his epic ep um, interview he did with <laughs> with Don Lemon. Oh, I love uh, that. I that love shit was it. hilarious. It because Don Lemon approached it like he was going to expose Elon Musk. What was but, that about? First of all, you're talking about one of the smartest human beings on earth, and you're trying to expose him. Yeah. And what happened? was it ended up exposing Don Lemon and making him look like a fool. Well, I think I try to, I definitely agree with you. I think the majority of people that would watch that would be like, what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Why does he keep doing these? What is he talking about? And then Elon's like answering him. He's like, yeah, man, if it's not against the law, I'm not taking it down. <laughs> oh, well, don't you think you have some culpability? Completely forgetting that he worked for fucking CNN. <laughs> Right. Who lied about everything? Um, I thought that was ironic, but I like to try to dig past that. So I actually spent some time that week, like in the comments, looking at like there's actually people on Don Lemon's side, but I don't know if they're just driven by their hatred for Elon Musk and his whiteness, or you know, and in, in the way he approaches things, or if they legitimately were like, "Yeah, Don, well done," like. Yeah. It blew my fucking mind. You know, we're, it's, yeah, me too. I read the comments and I do it for the same reason because I like yeah. to get, it's like a temperature check. Like, okay, mm -hmm. what, what are kind of people, just the average people thinking about this certain subject? And like, I, um, it's, it's funny because if you, if you sort the comments by um, most uh, popular, mm -hmm. they're all on Elon's side. But if you sort them by like most recent, they're all against him. Yeah, it's weird. That particular video. And I think right now, man, we are living in some very confusing times. And people's opinions are constantly being uh, manipulated as well as sh reshaped by yeah. by 30-second um, clips and by like... Right. The, human, the human attention span has been completely hijacked by um, code uh, uh, programmers. They are using these algorithms specifically to uh, optimize to the human attention span 
and they're hijacking that so they can get views. That's wild. That yeah. is fucking wild. Yep. Blows yep. my mind. Sorry, I'm geeking out on this shit. Oh, no, I mean, <laughs> you like, you know, in terms of like, I, I have the same exact approach in terms of just what I'm, when I'm trying to take a step back and just look at things from an objective standpoint and like, okay, let's not let my, my personal beliefs or my ego or any of that get involved. And let me just step back and look at this. And I'm like, man, this situation is yeah. crazy. Like, I, I always say, like, if aliens came down, you know, like in the movies when the aliens come down and they take over, they got these, like, you know, their superpowers, they're bigger, stronger, or they got, like, weapons that are stronger. But that's mm-hmm. not how they would take us over. They would just, it would be mind control. They would just manipulate us because we're yeah. so easily manipulated at, in the in mass. Like, you, yeah, can, yeah. you can take millions of people and and shape their beliefs over a short amount of time. Now, it's been proven over and over. It's been proven over and over for sure. Yeah. You're on. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a, I agree with you 100%. I wish the aliens would just fucking come though. Let's get it over with. <laughs> That'd be legit. Speaking of aliens, but no, not aliens, but rocket ships. I met this dude the other day. This blew my mind. Cause where I work at now kind of works in this field of uh, space. And so I'm like getting coffee. This guy's in there. I'm a nerd, so I'm like always introducing myself. What's going on? What up? And um, he's like, oh, hey. Uh, and I asked him, like, so what do you do? And he's like, oh, I, I, uh, I work in the safety realm. And, you know, this guy's job is to make sure that uh, he monitors rockets when they go on their launch to see if, they, uh, if anything falls off. And they, they measure how big that thing is, see what's the risk of it falling back to Earth and how they can prevent it in the future. And when he was just telling me this, I was like, what? That's your fucking life, bro. Yeah. It's <laughs> just crazy to me that like, because I love reading about this stuff. I always have. But like meeting this guy in person was the first like, whoa, fucking moment I've ever had. I can't wait yeah. to meet an astronaut. That's that's a very unique, uh, specific job. You know? That's what he does, bro. Like every day, like every week he's like, all right, I'm going I'm going on a trip. I'm going to go watch the next rocket launch. And that's what he does. Yeah. He comes yeah. back, does his, uh, he crunches his numbers with his team and then they figure out how to fucking make it better next time. And that just blows yeah, my mind. That's awesome. You can't tell him it, it, this ain't rocket science. You can't, no. <laughs> and you can't tell him nothing. Just like Kanye, bro. The guy, he's on another level, man. He's sending shit to space, bro. Go on. Yeah, that, trips, that trips me out. But we all find our path, you know. We all find our way and in, into the things that we get into in this world. So I, th- I think that's interesting. It's definitely interesting in hearing how you got into music, man. Like, it makes me reflect a lot on like, uh, on how how people find that that path for themselves and whatever niche that they get into. And it was cool hearing Sean Sean your story about Asher. Kind of like uh, it makes me want to dig back into that a little bit. If you guys are ready to to talk how the how the rubber met the road there. Because obviously you were cooking some stuff up um, with Outfit Entertainment and all those guys that you were collaborating with while Sean was just kind of getting into this stuff. And then, boom, some somewhere in there you guys collaborated yourself. So if you could take us back to that part when you first started like making music and things like, like that, and then um, we can go go back into that. I really want to hear, hear how that started. Yeah, for sure. So... Um... So like I said, you know, I was playing music and then I quit and my mom was like, you're going to regret this. And she was right, you know, uh, mm. so about about uh, so that was around age 10 or 11. And then about seven or eight years later, <clears throat> I'm at uh, Guitar Center. Oh, I don't know. Greatest just place ever, dude. Love that place, right? Fact. Anyone who hasn't Radio been there, Shack, Guitar Center. change your life. <laughs> and uh so I just ended up there somehow. It was actually my first time ever going there. Oh, well, like, which guitar center was it? It was uh, the one. They're closed now. It was in El Cerrito. They mm. don't. They don't my exist. uncle used to live out there. Yeah. So I was there, and I don't know how I ended up there, but I, and I saw this big ass keyboard. It was called an Ensonic MR76. It had 76 keys, and they were mm. weighted, so they they oh, had legit. action like a, a real piano. But I was messing with it, playing, you know, hitting different buttons and stuff, and it would give me a different sound. And I'm like, yeah. this, is, this is amazing. Bending sounds and doing all Oh, this yeah. Stuff. Those little rollers on the side. That shit is fucking cool. It had, like, 
all these like hundreds of you know for back then hundreds of sounds was a lot right yeah and everything strings drums everything and i'm like making beats in there and stuff and i'm just sitting there for like and this dude comes up to me and he goes that's a cool beat you know and um to sort of uh backtrack a little like i was really into hip-hop by this time yeah this was like late late high school i'm um, all i listened to is hip-hop mm -hmm. and um so i'm making beats and this guy's like that's a cool beat this kind of older guy and um i'm like it just something clicked in my head i'm like i want to do this shit yeah so i um had all i had some money saved up and i ended up getting this keyboard how, and, how old were you at this time i i think i was about 17 years old so i, I was still, still in, high in high school okay and um that's when i i we talked earlier that's when i i think i got this old school mac like oh yeah school mac mac um it was before the colorful macbooks or yeah, what, yeah. what do you call it IMAX. yeah they, imax yeah <laughs> so it was like this mac that if i still had today would be worth like 20 grand it was like this is uh, crazy it'd be like a collector's item like you know yeah. put it in the museum <laughs> it had a floppy disk i don't know what happened to it but anyways <laughs> i go to mac up i had like this uh mackie key mackie uh mixer mixer, mixer. Mm. And I hooked it up to my keyboard, and I just started making beats. And then I hooked it up to this tape player. Yes, I was using yeah tape. cassette. Let's go. <laughs> Ninety, and I was recording beats, and then I would like, but I'm like, I want to get, I need a rapper. Right. Like, I'm all these cool beats, but I need a rapper, and I'm like, I couldn't find a, a rapper. Right. I could like my friends, but all right. of them were as hell. Yeah. So I started like rapping <laughs> on my own beats yeah. and just, I would just listen to it on just to myself. I wouldn't yeah. share it with anyone. And, and I just fell in love with that process, you know, and, um, and That's like fun. sometimes I would listen to uh, like existing music, like, you know, Snoop came out at that time and like, um, you know, Smooth I was, as hell. I was a big fan of like the East coast stuff. So I would listen to some of those beats and then I would try to remake them on my, Oh Yeah. That's legit. You know, so that's, uh, oh yeah. And so that's how, um, that's how I got into it. But, um, in terms of when I really got started, I was working, I had started a, um, I had started a catering company with my cousin. Mm. I'm always the type to like, I've always, I've started so many businesses. Yeah. I, started a catering company with my my cousin and we were working this job pouring wine and i met this guy who's like i'm a lawyer <clears throat> and he goes you seem like a really like uh enterprising young man he's like you want to come work in my company i said yeah where is it he goes it's in oakland and you know you can have an internship there and you'll learn all kinds of stuff that you would never learn yeah I'm like, fuck it. I'm at, by this time, I'm like 18. I'm out of high school. I didn't know what I want to do with my life. I'm like, yeah, let me do it. So I started working as an intern. This was in West Oakland. Yeah. In the hood, like in on off of Mandela. Mandela is different now, again, just like a lot right. of other parts. But back then, it was like bullet holes in the windows in our studio. And like, it was just crazy. Crack people selling crack right outside. Yeah. But he had this inside was this like beautiful studio and they produced uh they they produced stuff for like lost for like uh civil lawsuits like they were produce videos for them and so mm. i learned so i started working for him and i learned graphic design that's cool as an intro and then i became friends with this pakistani guy uh who was a who was a video producer and then he got his nephew or brother-in-law Right. He got his brother-in-law to come work at this place in West Oakland. And the brother-in-law, his name was Roger. Mm. So Roger and I. Oh, so you met the other homie first? That's how I met. That's how we met. Oh, shit. Oh, Ron. Yeah, Ron. Ron. So Ron and I, Ron and I were friends. And then he got his brother-in-law to come get a job there. Oh, no way. I and that was that. Roger. That was his younger brother-in-law. And so Roger and I started talking and he's like, I'm into music. 
I'm like, I'm into music. We started vibing. We got our equipment and combined it and started making beats together. And then I'm like, you know what, dude? I always love starting businesses. Even I'm still young at this time, but I'm like, let's start a fucking record label. Yeah. And he goes, all right, what do we call it? I said, let's call it. At first, we called it the Eastern Conference. I don't Why? Know. I have no idea. <laughs> Basketball? <laughs> No, like, I, I think because I'm like I'm half Japanese and that's like the East. Ah, uh, and you're East Bay. He was South Asian. He's Pakistan. Yeah. But like we just figured, okay, we'll call it the Eastern Conference because it's like Eastern. It's exotic. <laughs> I don't know why. But then um, so we started making stuff and we're like, we need to find some same predicament. We need to find yeah. some rappers or some singers, somebody, right? So we started auditioning random singers and rappers and they were all whack. <laughs> they just all stuck and they're all like, like didn't have the drive or didn't have the look or didn't have the vocals. Like they're all missing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So him and I made a song together called, um, called Pain and Love. Hmm. It was me. I was saying something in English, right? And then he was saying something in, uh, I think, Urdu, which is. Right. Urdu is. It's the Pakistani language, right? It's one, yeah, one of. So he was rapping in Urdu, and I was, or he was not really rapping. He was more like singing, but it was, mm. had a rap flow to it. And we made this dope ass song that it's never been released, but it was, it was called Pain and Love. I still have it on one of my hard drives, probably. He ever going to let it go or what? I'll put it out. I just got to go it. to the hard drive. <laughs> Can't find a floppy it, disk. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it was a cool song, and I'm like, you know, I really like this balance of English and Urdu, right? Probably right. We liked it too, like on every hook you were on when we heard, like, because you were on the skates, you were like the Matrix type of like, because yeah. you every song was kind of like you would paint a picture with it. That was, and yes. it was a storytelling, exactly. And and you would come in and out of the album, you. Yeah, you were on the hooks, on the skits, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. So that was, I, so that was, yeah. Again, that goes back to like my whole creative thing. Like I would create these movies in my head. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to just make a song. I want to paint a picture. I want when the listener listens to this, I want them to be envisioning. Okay, like, you know, these guys are doing this at this moment. Yeah, like that, that one song. You feel like you were at the airport. Know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that was uh, the fast life. Exactly. The one in Miami. See, I didn't even have to say anything. Like, and uh, <laughs> oh, puts you in the airplane, right? Feeling cool right away. Yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so we, st so you know, I, we're we're stuck in this predicament where we're like, we don't have any artists. So I guess we got to be the artist, you know. And then we got his brother Rock. So mm -hmm. it was it was myself. It was, well, Ro Roger, right? Which I I call him Ra, mm -hmm. and it was other rock and we started making music and then we're like so roger and myself we wanted to be producers that was our dream like we looked up to guys like um i'm trying to think if timberland was out yet i think he was but we looked up to guys like hey, yeah, Tim, was timbo out. and you mm, know missy and timbo were out for sure uh, of course dre and like those guys yeah. we wanted to be like that and we wanted to have our own label and we looked up to um what's his name master p right he was no limit this was like back then uh, when no limit was known as the biggest independent label out there right yeah so we wanted to be these guys and um so since we couldn't find any artists we found rock which was his brother and we're <laughs> and we're like okay he's like but i can't rap and then uh, <laughs> and like, we're like you're about to be <laughs> i always wondered I was like, yo, why is this whole picture on the album? Yeah, because like, we're did... like, you know what? We're like, don't worry about it, man. Uh, I'm like, so I asked Roger, I said, what language is like more, what's the most popular language like in um, South Asian, like South Asian music, right? Mm -hmm. He said, him and Rock were like, oh, it's Punjabi. Like the Punjabi music kind of goes hard and like everybody likes the Punjabi music. So I said, do you know how to speak Punjabi? And he's like, well, it's pretty similar to my language. You know, the words are pronounced different, but I could, I could do it. 
So I'm like, okay, let's write some songs for, for rock to rap. Let's try yeah. rap. Because when I heard the language, I'm like, this language is beautiful. Yeah. It's got a certain cadence that fits perfectly over hip hop beats. Yep. Like, not all languages sound good on hip hop. That's a fact. Like to me, um, what's the worst sounding language on hip hop? I would say I haven't heard them all, but like French sounds kind of weird on hip hop to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I might catch a, a lot French of songs. I probably catch a lot of heat for that, but if, <laughs> if, if well, if, see, I mean, hip hop hip hop is an American uh, art form, right? So yeah. it's in English, but it's in American English. American, so even yeah. like even when in England rappers, they be kind of like I don't know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Someone in the book. Yeah, yeah. I put my beans on my my toast. <laughs> Get out of here! I don't want to hear that crap. But I mean, I mean, look, if, you're good enough, if you're good enough, yeah, you, it doesn't matter what language you speak. If you're good enough, facts. Ride that beat, and you can like, if you know how to spit, it doesn't matter what language. But Punjabi is like the way it sounds is like it just fits with hip hop with the yeah, beat. it's smooth as hell. And also, it's a very like metaphorical language. You're, it's not like like when you talk about a certain subject, you're using like metaphors. It's very poetic, mm -hmm. right? So it's so when when I started to understand that, I'm like, this is perfect. Like, so I so I, I we were he was writing stuff for his brother to perform, and and like we're doing take after take after take. Like oh, I'm I'm like, um okay. Try saying it this way. Try saying it that way. Uh, try. This is at your apartment in Oakland. This was all at my apartment in Oakland. Okay. Yeah. At, at, by this time, I, 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 lived, I remember that setup. Yeah, I lived in Oakland, and I was at an apartment there, and we we had the vocal booth in my closet, and we had all the hell yeah, running under the <laughs> door, you know, all the wire, <laughs> and um, for real, and we just could not get a good cake from, yeah. and so, so I'm like. I said to Roger, I'm like, Ra, can you go in there and rap the verse, right, as a scratch vocal so that mm -hmm. Rock can rap over it and he can just follow what you're doing? Right. So yeah. He goes in there Backtrack. and he raps. And it's like he's on beat and he's pretty good. And then Rock does it on top. And I'm like, bro, in my mind, I'm like, damn, Ra sounds better. His mm -hmm. vocals sound better. But I knew he didn't want to be a rapper. He, we had this discussion. He told me he's like, I want to be a producer. We wanted to be this like producer duo, right? Which I think by that time we had chosen to call it the Outfit instead of Eastern Conference. So you picked your name long term. Did you have um? Somebody else was called the Outfit, wasn't it? Uh, the there was a, there was another crew in Oakland called the Outfit, and they were it was there was some black guys. They were American rappers. Right? right we were coming up with this weird random thing which was punjabi rap which didn't really i mean pretty much didn't exist at there i think there were some guys before us but it really like no one had really heard of it yeah just the was yeah. name the punjabi mc yeah he but was, that guy was he wasn't really an mc he was just uh yeah. he had a few bars yeah a, a few but i mean yeah. he wasn't doing what we were doing and so we would run into these other guys called the outfit and we were the outfit. <laughs> but we kept it Is cool it like the Spider-Man meme? Well, <laughs> it was kind of like, yeah, it wasn't, well, there was no weird friction because we told them, we're like, yeah, we do this kind of rap. And they're like, well, we do this kind of rap. And we're like, okay, right. well, you don't really step on each other's toes. So go ahead call yourself yeah. the outfit, you know? It's like, good luck. See you later. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. But you got a different type of outfit on. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we um we basically you know that's a, that's and then so I I talk I sat down with Ra and I'm like bro um I'm like I don't think I, I don't know if um, Rock can carry the can can be the lead of our of our group oh okay I'm skipping ahead of myself so we needed a we we decided all right we're gonna be a group it's gonna be Shah. Mm -hmm. Roth and Rock, right. which is you see our pictures on the inside, which is that, yeah, right Three. there. Yeah. Ah, Ra and Rock. And we said we needed a, a name for the, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that was the group right there. We're like, gotcha. we need a name for the group. 
And so I started looking, by this time we're using Google, I'm Googling names, and I find um, Bohemia. I find Bohemian, and mm -hmm. the definition of Bohemian was somebody who lives kind of an alternative, not alternative, but just a, a lifestyle that's different from like the, the norm, like outside yep. the norm. And I said, I think that's very fitting for us because we're definitely doing something that's not normal, right? Right. You got a half Japanese, half Russian dude who's from the Bay. You got a Pakistani dude and his brother, and we're making Punjabi rap music. Like, we're <laughs> call ourselves Bohemia. It's an anomaly. Yeah, so we called ourselves Bohemia. It was a group. And um, and then so we made, we recorded our first album, which was called Vich, Vich Parde Sunday, which means in the foreign land, right? Yeah. And we just we just started knocking out tracks, and instead of Rock being the lead, it was uh, it was Ra being the lead vocalist, and then me doing all the English hooks. Mm -hmm. So we sort of like over time through trial and error for, formulated this method of where like our songs would be English hooks and um, Punjabi uh, vocal Punjabi verses. The production was very Dr. Dre like. A you know, with the theme, yeah. skits. So we wanted that because back then it wasn't like where you just drop a single. Right. And like someone downloads it on iTunes or whatever. It wasn't like that. It was no, like- No, you had to have a whole LP. Album. Yeah. And the album had like from start to finish was like a movie, like a whole yeah, story. Yeah, like you put a whole story to it. Yeah. yeah. And, that was, and that was sort of my plan is like, I'm like, I want this to be, I want us to tell this story about Vich Varde Sunday, about being in a foreign land. Right. You know, all Sounds the, like the immigrant story a little bit. The immigrant story, but make it a little more street, like try to make it more street. Gotcha. And so we um so we put that together and you know, I produce Rob produced some of the songs and then I produce a lot of the songs. And then um I basically like he would go in the booth and then he would rap and I'd be like, Okay, that sounds cool, but you know, you have a like a good voice, so let's try making it a little bit more melodic, or let's try to, mm. you know, I didn't the, the, the coaching reason, them right, coaching them into like uh, kind of the quality we're looking for the final product. Yeah, so I'm like, because I'm putting my, I'm I'm trying to be Dr. Dre at this time, so I'm like mm. that zone. I'm like, dude, this got to be perfect. It's yeah. Gotta be perfect. And like he would say something, and the crazy thing is, I don't understand what he's saying because I don't speak the language. So I'm only hearing sounds. Yeah. So when he says like Zindagi or something, right? Mm -hmm. I know what that means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's life, right? Yeah. So he says Zindagi. Yeah. But I don't know what the fuck that means at that time. Yeah. So I just hear a sound. So I'm like, try saying it this way. And I would tell him. Right. And like, understand the language. You're like, that sounds weird. But if you don't understand the language, you're like, Okay, I'll try saying it that way. But the reason why that worked is because I didn't understand. So I was, my mind was open. I'm not stuck in yeah. these parameters. You didn't have anything stuck. that said, that's not how it said. Exactly. <laughs> I was being bohemian. I was outside of the norm. Love it's, it. So he, um, so we just by accident almost like created this very unique sound on top of being, creating sort of like this Punjabi rap that had never really been out there big in the public. And then we, um, and then we're like, okay, we got to shoot a fucking uh, album cover. Right. So I'm like, well, hey, I know Photoshop. I've been learning it at our job where we work, you know, yep. worked at that place. So I, we. Plus you can tag. You don't need a font. Mm -hmm. You don't need to. <laughs> no, no. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I like, tag that font. That makes a difference. And then True. I'm, um, I'm like, let's let's you know do a photo shoot. We did it in my apartment, um, and then we were sort of debating: do we put us all three on the cover? We're like, we're not sure. And we start. We had already been giving out little demos to just people on the street. Yeah. So they had already been hearing our shit. So like one day we're walking in West Berkeley, and this um, Punjabi dude comes up to us, and he. He sees me, he goes, what's up, Shah? Gives me a handshake. He sees Roger, and he goes, what's up, Bohemia? Gives yeah. him a handshake. And I'm like, light bulb moment. 
light bulb went off in my head and I go, okay, it's, it makes more sense if you are Bohemia. Right. And he's like, I, bro, I told you, I want to be a producer. I don't want to be a rapper. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, this, look, this could work, man. I said, you know, we'll be a team. Like it's shot, it's shot and rock. Shot that rock. That's a mm-hmm. that's a cool song on the album called. Shot we Tedra. we made a song called Shot that rock, which means yeah. shot and. Bro, rock. That, I used to bump that shit every time I used to come see you. I used to be like, shot what? Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and so you I don't know, know. I was I, I was hella just juiced off of that. You know what I mean? That was a and, dope song. And, and meeting you guys, I was like, damn, you you guys fucking made this music, bro. Yeah, like and, I was like, yo, check my beats out. Let's uh. Let's, <laughs> Yeah, so like we made all that shit and then uh, we we pressed it. Um, I went and got like a thousand copies pressed, and then I think they fucked up on the graphics, so they gave us another thousand. So we had two thousand instead of one thousand. Mm. And then um, we just started. Uh, we were trying to sell them, but it was kind of moving slow. So we um, we would just go to these like Indian parties and pass them out for free. Oh shit! And then after a while, we started getting. We set up a website. And then people started like hitting us up on the website, like, "Hey, yo, man, I heard your music. That's crazy. Like, I've never heard anything like this." Mm-hmm. And then we started getting people interested in interviewing us. Right. And then, and then again, like, it was all new to us, and I, you know, again, like, Rob was kind of a little um, hesitant to be out there in the front, like, in the spotlight. He, he right. Kind of, he's still like being the producer, face of it. Being a producer, yeah. So like. When they would want to interview us, I would just say, "Okay, well, we'll do a, um, we'll do a, a what's it called? A, 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 a paper interview. A paper interview where right. you read it, where it's not like face to face, you know." Right. It was. I would say, "Just send me the questions," and then they would send me the questions, and I would answer them. He yeah. wouldn't. Answer. And this is before iPhones and shit. And like, I, like yeah. newspaper magazines were yeah. still a thing. So yeah. like. I would, there was one called, uh, what was it called? Daisy, uh, um, uh, Daisy club. Daisy club.com. Yeah. And I would answer the interview because I had this vision of where I wanted to take the, our group. Right. I'm mm-hmm. like, I want us to be seen in a certain way. So I would write the interview, but I wouldn't just write answers like, Oh, well I grew up here. I'd be like, <laughs> I would write whole fucking like stories. I'd be like, as if the interviewer was came to our hood or whatever. <laughs> like, you know, as the train goes by in the background, like I'm hearing people outside and you know um, cars honking and like there it's it's chaotic. Yeah. The neighborhood is chaotic and like I would write all this stuff and then I would put the and you know I asked Bohemia like where did you get the info and then I would I would paint this picture and, yeah. and then I'd send it back to them and be like hey I wrote a little extra. Is it <laughs> a little bit? <laughs> and they'd read it and they'd be like, damn, this is a whole fucking story. They'd be like, oh, uh, yeah, is it? And like they would take credit for it, but I didn't care. Yeah, yeah. Because be you're like, still getting it out there. The, the, one of the first viral interview, it was just you against you. It was your questions, your answers, your I'm not going to say, yeah, I won't. I'm not going <laughs> to out the journalist because yeah. the journalist yeah. is a cool person. But yeah, sir. the one of the biggest interviews that really put us on the map, I wrote the entire thing. It was this person sent me some garbage ass questions. It was <laughs> basic, most basic, boring shit that yeah. any interviewer could send you. And I'm like, hey, is it okay if I just write this whole thing? And it, be, before she even this person even answered me, I sent this person. I had already finished it. Right. Be- they even said if it's okay because I knew once they read it, I'm a pretty good writer. Like, bro, you you painted the whole picture. Like, people yeah. got a whole idea off of that interview. They like they started getting to know the persona. Oh, the dude, I painted a whole picture, man. I created a movie. The, the character I, yeah. you created became live in the interview. Right, like, and and I made this individual Bohemia who kind of didn't really was get had a little buzz, but I made this person look like damn this like dude from like who like where is this this dude came out of nowhere like damn he he did all this and that and um it just became that's where the 
the the ball really started rolling you know yeah. and by that time we put out the first album it's part day sunday and we actually started getting sales we actually didn't have to really give them away as much right um, and then um it was weird like people would just hit us up and then that's when facebook i'm uh, not facebook uh myspace. myspace myspace so we started using that as a promotional tool you know that's the first place to, uh earlier when we first started our discussion i was telling you that um through you know that that kind of distance right i was still keeping in touch with sean at the time but myspace lets me see what was sean's up to yeah. at the time where um in 2004 i left i went overseas and i was overseas for three years straight and i didn't come back to the united states till 2008 so the whole world was changing around me, but I was able to kind of keep up with it a little bit because of MySpace. So I actually saw, you know, Sean, the first time I'd ever heard of Bohemia or Sha One or anything like that was on MySpace. Yeah, I really love MySpace. So I used to, best. I used to sit there, literally, I would, I would spend four hours. Because <clears throat> back then you could add people. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know what their term was, but you could friend people and you could just do it all day. So I'd friend, 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 friend. And I built us up to have like, you know, 10,000 followers back then. And that was a lot. And yep. people would just be like, who is this guy? And they'd be like, okay, they'd accept my friend thing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, click, 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 click. And then they, sometimes they would even email, I mean, not email, they would, they would DM us and be like, yo, like I heard your music. Like, thanks for adding me. Like, yo, yeah. your music is really cool. And it's, and it's me, I'm responding. I'm like, oh, thanks, bro. Like, yeah, I appreciate it, you know. <laughs> um, what about the video? Uh, can you take us back to the video where you had uh, printed big money for the video? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, we can get into that. But so we, so we released that album, and we started getting some buzz and some interviews and people following us. And um, it, But I realized another thing, right? So, again... I'm painting this picture. I'm trying to, like you said earlier, I'm trying to, there's a blank canvas and now it's got a little bit of paint on it. Mm -hmm. but, what, but what do I want people to see? Right. It's up to, it's up to me and it's right. up to me and Rod. It's up to the outfit. What do I want? What do we really want people to see? Is it just this new kind of music? Is that going to be enough? No, it, it can't right. just be good music. It's, there's got to be more to it. So I'm like, we used to go to this place called Lee's Donuts, which was underneath my apartment building. Mm -hmm. it was a donut spot. And that's where we would have our brainstorms, me and Rock. And by this time, Rock is not even, he's just doing his own thing. Gotcha. So it's, it's now the outfit is just myself and Ra. And um, Rock and KG, who's uh, Ra's cousin, they were, they were all around us, but like in terms of, um, uh, navigating the ship and like kind of directing where we want this thing to go. It was myself and Ra. Right. We had a meeting at um, these donuts and I'm like, bro, you need to come out with a second album, but it's gotta be, it's got like our first album is kind of all over the place. Like it's some of the songs sound like dark and mysterious. Some of them sound street. Some of them sound like romantic. It's like, it, like we gotta have, be more tight and i'm like i think we got to be more just street it's just mm -hmm. got to be street. like we got to talk about oakland we got to talk about just shit that goes on in this in oakland and it's got to be more just just street and that should be it and we got to be more hardcore and like at that time punjabi like desi music desi is like south like people who are of south asian descent the, right the exact translation of desi means generic generic it's like like coca-cola yeah is the brand but safe with slack is the desi word so what does desi mean i thought the it word means... the word desi means country and desi means okay I so see. anything local and generic sean say say that into the mic sean <laughs> <laughs> AC just means generic. It's like when you you could have Coke or a, a, a Daisy, whatever cola. Okay. Yeah, 
but basically if if you're yeah. if you say if you go up to a, a south asian person yeah like are means you, local it, but you could say like are you desi and they would be like yeah yeah I'm desi. Okay. so it'd be like okay uh if a certain product is made in your town mm -hmm. it's local that's desi. local or generic oh Whatever, okay. whatever's common around your hood that's oh yeah this is this like uh this is the desi way to fix it but oh, you could okay, go to okay. the mechanic okay see i didn't know that <laughs> we were we were like okay um damn i got kind of off track but no. we basically were like we, i i said i was like we gotta let's let's make this shit more street like mm -hmm. even though we're like at that time daisy music was mostly um um like Punjabi singing, right? Like mm -hmm. they would they would play the dole drums or the or the tabla yeah. and then be a dude singing and right. it'd be like yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, exactly. it's, and that shit sounds fire. Like I love right. that. Yeah. But what we were doing was way different. Yeah. So like, yeah. It's not enough just to be different. Like we gotta be very we gotta be shocking. Right. Like some shit that's gonna make somebody's auntie be like what the hell are you listening to yeah <laughs> like i imagine maybe nwa did that shit too back in the day right mm -hmm. so we so we're like okay this next theme is going to be something way harder way more street so we um started working on the next album and years have already gone by by now like we're taking a long ass time to get shit done and we start working on um the next album, which was Esa Nasha Piar, mm -hmm. which is um, money. Nasha is like drugs or it's kind of like being high. Yeah. And Piar is love. So like money, drugs, and love. Sex, right? love, and rock and roll. Yeah. So yeah. like three very potent, powerful, and controversial things, right? Right. Um, Edgy. And we, and at that time. Uh, that was uh, your idea as well, like taking that title, right? Well, I didn't know what those things meant, but I wanted it to be kind of like I was looking at Grand Theft Auto. So Pesa mm -hmm. Nasha PR, Grand Theft Auto, like a three matter, word. Matter of fact, this is the. That's our original. Yeah, this is just a print off of a. This is the original, like before. Yeah. It, so we didn't, we didn't, one. we didn't end up using that cover, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. The helicopter and the windows and everything. Mm hmm. That one the image creation. Yeah, so we, like, that is because, so, like I said, we, we treated this shit like, some, like, we were very serious about it. We weren't just fucking around. Like, we, we would, I would come up with different options for our album covers, for our artwork. Yeah. We, we would make, like, we probably recorded, like, 30 songs, but we only selected maybe. I don't remember how many, but maybe like sixteen songs on the album. Bro, real um, quick, as a as a graphic student, I used to trip off Michelle's covers. I'd be like, "Damn, bro, that's why." Step your game up, Sean. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I learned from him. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. You I know, I was always inspired. I was like, "Bro, you're really fucking good at this." Like with or without Photoshop, like you could do that with your hands. Yeah, well, my, thank you. My bad, though. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> I got it. Um, I gotta be a bit of a drink champ, champ over here and like <laughs> the flowers over here. No, I, I appreciate it, man. Mix man is always very like complimentary of you know, and I really appreciate. Bro, if that. I see some dope shit, I have to I have to say that because of course I can't say that about some whack ass shit. I can't tell a fool be like, yo, that shit's hella whack. But if it's dope, I'm, I'm, I'm on that. <laughs> You're all about the love, not the harsh criticisms. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't even comment on whack, some whack ass shit. If something is whack, fucking let them know. It's like, hey, yeah. save them some time, you know. But like, <laughs> yeah, we fucking uh, we we recorded a bunch of music, um, and then we got uh, some Snoop uh, vocals for one of our songs, mm -hmm. um, which was dope. And then we got. Um, Imagine if we got those vocals now with the with the all AI stuff, because you oh, know, because yeah. you know, in that in that Snoop song. I made Snoop say the say things that he didn't say, right, right. Because I because I went on and I and I collected every every acapella of Snoop because because the verse we had was already mixed down. It had already ad libs. It wasn't a studio session. Yeah, yeah. We, we had to chop it up and then 
there's a few things Snoop said. It's entirely from a, a, a Tupac and a Snoop Dogg song where he says, my boy Bun B or something. I cut the He bun. says, uh, uh, battle act, uh, uh, battle cat on the beat. No, but he, he says Pardon. something about my boy, um, either Bun B or some other type of B, John B on the something. Something, yeah. So I cut the middle part and I cut my boy B on the shit. Well, actually, so let's, uh, so, yeah, so we were, um, while we're recording this album, we're in the in the doing shows, right? And that's yeah. how we, that's when Mixman came into the picture. Mm. So, so while you're recording the second album that you guys put out there, that's how you guys first met. Yeah, that's how we met Sean. Nice. Yeah, and uh, so how, you were talking about that earlier, like, like when like you came to one of our parties, right, or one of our shows. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um. Yeah, so I, I I took my beat from our Markley project. I mean, Markley mm-hmm. project. For like 16 tracks, I went to one of the parties just because cause I was already out there doing my DJ thing. So I was already at the parties all the time. But I wanted to check them out. So I went there. I saw it. I was like, hell yeah. But I didn't see Shaw there. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up handing my... Uh, my blank disc of C, uh, music yeah because i was like hey um maybe they'll want to rap on my stuff and you know i could collaborate with them and i came home but i didn't give them no contact info and uh, one of my other homies the homie went home and heard my beats and then he was like yo uh he liked what he heard so he he, he was trying to look for me but there was no contact info because I didn't think about putting my number on it. <laughs> I didn't think it through like that much. I, I yeah. just kind of pulled up. And so they ended up calling my boy Nick. He he uh, promotes parties and shit like that. So he put us together. He gave him uh, my number. He called me. And then I was kind of surprised. I was like, oh, the homies just called me about the music there. He pulled up at my house and we started recording the same day. Like the second day he pulled up at my house. Yeah. And, um, and then I, after that day, I started doing everything with them. Gotcha. Videos, I'm there. If there's a studio session, I'm there. If we're going to a show, I'm going with them. Yeah, yeah. And I just started hanging out. And then when I'm at Sha, like, it was a moment. I was like, oh, my God, that's the dude they were talking about on the song. And um, the, the more I learned about it, I was like, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in the right spot because I'm, I'm learning. And I'm doing not just remixes. I'm, I'm producing music, and I have, I have guidance. So it's like, it's, I yeah. can't, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was like it was cool to have Sean on because at that point I was producing almost every beat, and I was also kind of like in analog. The, in Sean the, was analog as fuck. Analog as fuck, and I was producing a lot of the shit, and I was also in the cat. Um, the producer's chair like right trying to I, tell everybody what to do and all that yeah i'm like orchestrating i'm i'm also editing the songs like post production I'm, I'm controlling the whole matrix everything like the whole vision like i'm cutting verses out i'm i'm doing all kinds of shit just to make the songs as perfect as possible right you know? yeah and I, I remember how much time you spent i used to be uh tripping off of how much time shot spent on like snares and shit like that like days months. yeah you know and it was cool to have mix in there because all of a sudden i got i don't have to worry so much about beats right so i can focus on just fine tuning uh, and everything the music and he can make some of the beats and he was making like some some dope ass music and so he would play me his beats and then we would go through them and i'm like oh this one this one you know Hell yeah, I always had the craziest drums because my thing was I'm going to find yeah. the trippiest drums or whatever, you know what I mean? And then, Oh, I know I, what you mean. I, I was like, <laughs> oh, like, like we were saying earlier, I was very honest. Like if something was whack, sometimes Mix would come to me, some, he'd be like excited. <laughs> he'd come yeah. to me and play me a beat and I'd be like, oh, I don't really like it, man. <laughs> and he would have this look on his face. Like, like, what? But I had to be real with him. Like, I'm not going right. to, I like this shit and be like, oh, yeah, give it to me. Yeah. And then bury it somewhere. You know, it's like, man. Nope. So, so that's why I made Hello Beats because I already know, like, 
I'm gonna learn. Yeah, you gotta have you gotta have a selection. So, uh, I mean, shit, man, it gets it gets deeper. We can get into it if you want me to. Yeah. So, I mean, where were you guys going with this album? Where was your vision on it? And then, what was the what was the traction like? Was pe- was it gonna go big? Where was, was it? Po- where was it popular and things like that? There was a lot of hype from it, and we actually the first song for the album was called Shah Terra. Mm-hmm. Shah and Ra. So Shah means like he was saying, it's kind of like the, the the boss or the king, and then Ra Ra Raja actually means prince. Right. Right. So so it kind of yeah. actually worked because it was Shah and Ra, who's Bohemian. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know the the king and the prince kind of like, and we had this. Um, we had this kind of like, it, we were on that frequency that we were talking about earlier, where human, where Shah and Ra, we could um, almost like read each other's minds. Like he knew, we, we had been working together so closely that he kind of knew what I was looking for and I knew what he was going to give me, right? Yeah. So we would, so the music, if you go back even to this day, this was a long time ago, the music sounds very well put together. Mm-hmm. Because it was because we were on this frequency, it's we, in sync. Shatera, yeah, yeah. Um, so we would make. So we decided to make the first song called Shatera, and um, it was about basically us. The song is kind of about like the music, right? It's about yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And then we decided to shoot a video for it, and we got. Um, this was back then, even though we were doing a little bit. Of shows here and there and selling a few albums here and there we still were trying to get everything for free so right. we got we got these dudes i don't know how we found them but they were like yeah we'll shoot your video for free as yeah. long as, as long as we get credit for shooting it so we're like okay hell yeah and then we said uh where you want to shoot it uh i said i know the exact spot i know the right exact behind spot. your apartments I was, like, <laughs> I was like and these were like two um kind of like rock and roll white dudes like long yeah. hair to like rock music the, the the directors but i'm like we're about to go to west oakland to the old train station which is just smack in the middle of the hood back then yeah. i don't even know if it's there anymore but so you had to the train station was abandoned and you had to break into it you had to hop the fence and then we just start telling people to show up on this certain day and and um but it was like a bunch of dudes, like rowdy ass dudes. We're like, <laughs> yeah, girl, we need at least one female. So we put this ad out in Craigslist. We're like, we're looking for models. Oh yeah, Craigslist, baby. Let's go. <laughs> one, girl, one girl showed up. <laughs> and she's the only girl that's in that video. I don't know if that video is online, but maybe we can find it and then I'll I'll try to find it and send it to you. But it's probably- see if Jaime, Jaime might have it over here on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Shot, but um, uh, so I'll type it while you tell the story. I'll type it and see if it pops up. Goes up, and then we're interviewed. Uh, we I don't know why we fucking interviewed her. I mean, she was just a model for the for the thing. But we're like, <laughs> we literally sat her down and interviewed her like she was about to, you know, like like get a job or something. Yeah. And then um, she ends up being the the main girl in the video, and um, yeah. Oh no way! Yeah, so so yeah. she. Oh no way! And then, uh, long. Story, oh yeah, it's on here. It's on YouTube, bro. Okay, it must be, <laughs> it must be, uh, uh, pixelated as fuck, dude. It's it like, is. It is. Yeah. So if you watch the video, man, you can see like all these dudes showed up. Dudes had guns, <laughs> mustangs and shit going crazy. I some of my friends showed up. They had mustangs. Everyone was just going. Pretty much, it was like a sideshow. It was basically a, a, a daytime sideshow in West Oakland. Yeah. And um. And you guys were burning money. I had a bunch of money that I I, I burned. <laughs> However, I'll tell this now because it's been like twenty years. Yeah. That money wasn't even real, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I I remember some some dude came up to me. He was like, "Man, you guys are burning this money." It's yeah. Like, people were even at the video shoot. They were getting mad. They're like, "You burning fucking hundred dollar bills, bro? Like, <laughs> I want some of those." And I'm like, <laughs> shits aren't even real. You want to do a screen share? You want to talk us through this video? It might not be the best quality on the YouTube because it looks like somebody just loaded it up. No, 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 no. No? Okay. 
<laughs> you know, oh, all right, we, yeah, you might get you might get uh, flagged or some shit. Yeah, eh, maybe, maybe not. Let but, him come uh, for me. I don't know who Gaurav Sharawat is, but that's who posted it. He's only got forty six subscribers, so I think we'd be okay. <laughs> shout out to Gaurav. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so that so, anyways, um, that shit went down. It, it was a fun video to shoot. It went it went pretty crazy. Hell yeah, it looks fun. <laughs> That video uh, blew up a lot. They took it down. They took it down. Or I, I, I'm pretty sure Rod, Roger took it down. But it had a, a lot of people were feeling that video. And um, yeah. and so that girl ended up being, him and her started a little thing together, right? Hell and yeah. She, Best relationship up, start off Craigslist. Yeah. No. And she ended up being his manager. No knocks. No knocks. So, that was cool. We needed a manager because, again, it was right. just him and I kind of doing, holding all these different, wearing these different. Yeah, hats. there's a there's a reason that like teams have different roles on them, because yeah. if one person's doing it all, you get fucking smoked. Right. So now we got our DJ slash other second producer. Mm -hmm. We got, you know, I was an intern. I was just down to learn from you because I was into the things you were doing, but I wasn't on that level, and I was mm -hmm. just happy to be around y'all. Yeah, we were, and I was fucking happy to have you with us, man. And like, you know, he was like my little brother. Like, we we clicked real, bro. I remember we vibe real quick. I remember not even being twenty one yet and passing out flyers outside of like giant games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did all, <laughs> all straight from the dirt, man. We did it. It's too but funny. Like, I'm gonna tell you, if I didn't join the Air Force, I probably would have been with y'all. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. me and Sean was everywhere. Hell yeah, that would have been. That would have been dope, man. Like, but we're still here. Yeah, it's just exactly. twenty years later. <laughs> Circle. Yeah. Full circle. Like, um, so him. So now we got a manager, mm -hmm. and so it's like it's like Harvard edu not Harvard, Stanford educated, Stanford. um, kind of like from the uh, suburbs type of situation. And she's like, so I'm like, cool. This is cool. Like, you know, she can help get us shows. You know, right. she can call places and be like, hey, I have this act. Or she can help get us interviews, things like that. Yeah, but, yeah. But then she's like, starts getting more involved in the whole overall thing, and the I'm image like, image part special. And I'm like, look, I have a, I have a very specific vision for this. I even, excuse me, I called a meeting, and I'm like, look, here's the plan. I had a step by step, four year plan. Mm. Like, I'm like, we're gonna put this album out independently. Um, again, I'm trying to be Master P, right? Right. We already put the know. first album out. Now it's time for the second album, independent, because that way we own the masters, we own mm -hmm. the music, and we get 100% of the profits. Okay? And then I'm like, then we'll put one more album out, but this, this time we can't take four years. We'll just put it out next year, right? Right. Album. And then that will have, that will mean we got three albums out, all three of them are going to be each time we put one out is more popular than the last. I know right. that's keep growing it. What that gives us is leverage. That leverage will enable us to get a deal with a major. However, we will have the, the enough leverage to negotiate that deal. Yeah. If you don't have shit and nobody knows who the fuck you are, you there's no negotiation. Yeah. They own everything. They're the, they're the ones with all the power. And they'll just get decide what you get. I didn't want to be in that position. However, um, all of a sudden it went from being Shah Tera to Shah Tera Te. I'm not going to say her name. Right. Because I don't know if she's Craigslist. I don't know. <laughs> My bad. Out of respect, because I don't know if Ever. she wants to be put out. Like that, but facts. So like now that. all of a sudden it was three people. Craig making all the decisions, right? Shout the code word is Craig. <laughs> and and she, um, so and plus they're living together now. So like it's mm. I'm kind of already seeing this wedge being formed, right? This this got you between my plan and their plan. And also at this time, like he's starting to get notoriety, and it's no longer a group, right? It's a it's a solo act, and people are starting to even like come up to him and be like, what's up, Bohemia? You know, like he right. started to know. And so yeah. that's, that feeds your ego, right? You're like, man, I'm, shit, man, I'm actually, 
I'm glad I am the rapper. Like I used to not want to be. Now, fuck, man, this is dope. Like, like right. people are up to me, taking pictures with me and shit. Yeah. So then, Those are calling you to promote their clothing lines, sending you all shirts. of a sudden clothing lines are getting a hold of us. Random, not even uh, Daisy clothing lines, like American dudes who have like T-shirt brands or whatever are calling us and be like, "Hey, would you wear our shirt? You know, we'll make one specially for you." And like we're <laughs> we're starting to get a buzz in the street, right? And um, she's like, "Oh, well, the next move needs to be where we sign with a major." And I'm like, "No, no, 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 no." We will do that, but we got to put out at least three albums before we do that, you know? And she, she just wasn't down with your plan, huh? Like, no, we got to sign with the major. That's how we're going to get big. And I'm like, I, I do care about getting big, but I also want to make money off of this shit. I don't want to be some artist or some, you know, record label that, you know, we everyone thinks we have money just because we're popular. But the truth is we're fucking struggling because we signed a bad deal. Right. I want to I want to own our masters. I want to maybe we do some kind of like um you know split with a distribution or whatever, but I want to make sure that we are the decision makers and we drive this vehicle. And yeah. and that's where things started to go like this, you know. Mm. And like I remember Ron and I would have these private discussions where he'd be like torn. He's like if she keeps telling me this and telling me that and he's like, but you're telling me this and you're telling me that. And I'm like, look, dude, we fucking started this shit together. Like, let's stick to our plan. Like, why are we changing the plan? Yeah. Then shit got crazy. And she's like, so we started planning the album cover for the for that album. And like, you know, it was that um, Grand Theft GTA, Auto. yeah. She's like, no, I think he should be wearing a silk shirt and have his hair combed over like to the side like he should be more yeah, present she was talking about button ups and button up shit. silk shirt he should be more presentable and she's like you should wear that stuff too because you, you know <laughs> sometimes in pictures and interviews and i'm like i'm not wearing a fucking silk button up shirt like <laughs> but i want because because he's the guy that came up with the image and the story right. the and t-shirt the baggy shirts and, and the like, he, he, yeah that's the culture breaks you mean yeah, I was like, look, we got this. Th th this is like our image. Our image is like some street shit. We're not doing this like boys to men stuff, like R&B group. And again, there was like, I couldn't be, I, that's his girl. So I can't, there's only so far I can like push my, I didn't want to get in between them. And like, it was just a weird situation. Like, yeah, it sucks. I want to have respect for, and but I know they live together. So they're coming up with all kinds of plans or our thing while they're together, right? Yeah. And so then, when, when you, she's managing him, then there's there's less input from you when when uh, people are reaching out for labels or shows. Yeah. It's so like she's kind of like it's gatekeeping, man. That's what yeah, it's called. Exactly. So like then I start hearing like from other people, they're like, "Oh, how come you weren't at the video shoot?" I'm like, "What video shoot?" Oh, they went to LA and did this video. I'm like what oh yeah. yeah yeah she was there yeah he, i co-funded that video he was there and i'm like i didn't even know they shot a video and then they'd be like oh how come you didn't you weren't at this show or whatever i'm like what show they start doing all this shit and they're just like you know shot doesn't need to know or whatever and then um so things just and then so basically they force their they force their way and they're like we want to get signed by a major mm. and i and so I remember going home and just <clears throat> thinking, I'm like, okay, what's the best move for me right now? Is it to keep fighting and being like, no, we're going to stick to the plan? Or is it to just work with them and then sort of back them up on this whole signing with a major uh, idea? And then wherever it goes from there, um, then we can, I can kind of try to, at least get back in the mix and try to keep building what we were building. But now we're signed to a major. And I was like, okay, as long as we don't lose the rights to our masters, right? As long as yeah. we are still driving this vehicle, I said, I made that conscious decision. I'm like, I'm going to go with it because there's too much like friction. It's just too weird. Yeah. So, you get kind of tired of fighting about it yeah. all the time and having these dis disagreements. Yeah, so I called a meeting with them, and I'm like, I went to their house, and I'm like, look, I'm like, everyone has a role to play in this thing, 
I'm like, you know, you um you are the manager, so you you know find deals for us, find um, collaborations with you know merchandise or whatever. You do your thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, she she was actually hella good at. She was good at that stuff. At, at writing emails and shit. Yeah, and I'm she like, come from that business venture capitalist yeah. environment. She's very smart and highly educated. And then I'm like, okay, Ra, you're the face of this. You're the rat. You're the voice people here, and you're like the sort of you know this, this person that we've this we've created this image. And then me, I'm behind the scenes, sort of like driving the vehicle, creating this whole like thing that we want to present to the world, right? Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then of course we got mix, and we also had at that time um, KG, which was uh, he was Ra's cousin, and he was also a singer. So he was singing on a lot of the hooks. He's singing mm-hmm. on one of our big songs, which was Sahara. He's the singer right. on that. Okay, so we got to give him credit for that. Um, and uh, um, and then I we basically had that meeting, and I thought, and they were like, "Yeah, okay," and I'm thinking everything's cool, but then um, they're still like they're still you know trying to get this deal, this major deal. And I think finally they landed something. With, um, it was uh, what was it, Bali Sagu? Was it? Uh, Ish, yeah, was it Ish, 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 Ish Records, Ish. which was a um, uh, uh, indie label out there in London, mm-hmm. and then through that, being a little, getting a little recognition, we were able. To, they landed a, a deal with a pressing and distribution with uh, uh, Universal, Universal, with Universal India, right? Got you. And then um, they had a, there was like this big press tour that they planned and everything, and they're like, they're like raw, they're like we want Shah Tera, Shah and Ra to come out and do this press tour with us before we release the album. And I'm like, I, I was excited about that. But like I said, my mom had a lot of health issues. Right. She happened to be having some health problems. And I'm like, I can't go. And he's like, well, we got two tickets. I said, just bring your girl with you, our man, your manager. Mm-hmm. So they went, they did the press tour. And then when they came back, the vibe was just very different. Was, I never got a call back after that trip. It was different, man. Like, it was. I ain't hear back. Yeah, it was just different. Like all, it was almost as if they're like something happened out there. Yeah. And then this person, she, our manager, the manager, she told me, she's like, uh, you know, Ross says that you guys are, or she's Ross says that you're disposable. And I'm like, Jeez. you know, he, she, it, she was, I think they had actually argued. And so she like was like venting it. And she's like, Ross says you're disposable. I've, I've heard that from her. Too. Yeah. Every, everybody's disposable. Yeah. Everyone's disposable. Everybody's replaceable or and, some, some bullshit like that. Yeah. And you're disposable. And I'm like, and then I, st- I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, now that they signed the deal and now that the album is being pushed out by Universal, who's this giant in the music industry, mm-hmm. maybe I, damn, I guess he's right. I am disposable, you know? And I'm like... Yeah, once you help him cross the fence... Yeah, and I was like, on the other I was, side. so I was, it was, it just took me, but it took me by surprise because, you know, when you're that close to somebody and you've been working that hard on something with that person, like, yeah, you just don't think if... Most people, you're not going to think about that stuff, right? But it, if you're a businessman and you're all business, yeah, you're definitely thinking, okay, I got to watch it. Like, I can't just right. completely be vulnerable, right? But if it's just two, two guys who became friends who started, like, creating this thing out of nothing, you're not mm-hmm. thinking about this stuff, right? And so that's when, like, stuff really started falling apart. And, um, yeah. Did you guys still work together after, during that, that part, after the, uh, the trip to what we said, London, right? The press yeah. release and all that. Yeah, we you guys worked together we still for a little bit. We did work together still, but the vibe was very different. Like it was just, it was like, you could feel it. It wasn't the same. And, um, and then after a while, like we just stopped, like everything just sort of like fell apart. And, um, 
And uh, so let me get this. Actually, I'm going to put this out there. Okay. okay. I want to put this out into the public. So for anybody who watches this, who um, is a fan of that, you know, the outfit and the, that era of Bohemia, first of all, you need to know that everything I'm speaking tonight is the truth because I already know because this has happened before where I've, I've never really spoken in public about this, but I've put right. a little, little things out here and there. And there's a team of people out there that will immediately deny it and say it's fraud and say, I'm making this shit up. And like, I'm this and I'm that. Start reporting this. Yeah. <laughs> so it, at this point in my life, I'm a, I'm on a whole new chapter. I don't care right. if you believe it or not, but I am telling you, everything I just said is true. And everything that I continue to say in this. In you guys continue real quick. I'll be right back. Okay. Hey, talk. <laughs> other my guys <laughs> everything i say tonight is the truth right and nothing yeah. but the truth. and um so, there, so he he i guess there's a song where he i i stopped listening to that music after um we stopped working together yeah i was just like I, it, it was a very kind of a a weird time in my life so i'm like you know what i'm just not going to listen to this stuff anymore did you still make music after you guys had had stopped, Absolutely. yeah. But I heard just still being in touch with a lot of these guys, like especially Mixman. I heard there was a song where he talks about some about me suing him. Oh right. Wow. And of course, the fans are like, "Oh, that's a bitch ass thing to do," right? So they just automatically believed it. Well, of course, because I don't have a voice. I'm not out right. there. I even have I have social media, but I never use it. Right. Yeah. I barely like you can find me. I it's like I don't have I, I'm just not out there, right? Yeah. So I wanna but I, I figure I'll let me clear that up. So there was uh so when you think of a lawsuit, you think of somebody trying to take money from another person, right? Right. Trying to sue somebody. Yeah, like, yeah, true. I had these lawyers and they took on they took on the case. But it wasn't, there's a reason for this case. I started looking into our publishing. When you mm. put out music, right? And it's like actually out there for sale and you yeah. own intellectual property. You have to register it with ASCAP or with another uh, BMI, I think is the other one. Yeah. You register it and you basically put your name there as the, um, as the, the creator of that music and what that does is it protects you um it it basically gives you the you know the, the rights to that intellectual property and it protects you from other people using that music um if they do use it they have to pay you for it right right so a royalty you're claiming to yes so you're claiming to the world that this is my creation right and i own this yeah so he went he had you know again like i said we were like you know, at least from my perspective, we were friends. He went and registered all of our music, but I found out he didn't put me on there. Wow. So he just, basically that makes it seem like he's claiming it's all original, his work only. So I found some lawyers and we basically, long story short, were able to give me as a, you know, 50-50 creator of all that music, the first Good. two albums. And that's what it was about, right? Yeah. So, so anybody who listened i've never heard that song but have you heard it there's the song where he talks about somebody suing him he's suing him oh yeah yeah yeah. i know what you're talking is about. that is he talking i don't even know if he's referring to it, but that's what that was about that's it was i was trying to get the rights to my creation back half of it 50 percent. yeah but like what kind of weird shit is that you know it just I don't know. The whole thing was weird, and and you um, know, bro. I mean, I know for sure. You still got some credit. My name was taken off of the joint. Yeah, and um, cause when I got signed to the outfit, it wasn't no paper contract. It was based off of love. Yeah, like it was. I didn't. I never thought. I needed a contract mm -hmm. because I was like, these are big bros. Like, whatever. I, wherever I go, 
I'm going with y'all. That's how it was for a while, though. Yeah. We yeah. had a great time going to Sasa auditions. For me, because I was a youngin', that was like, you know, like Dr. Dre and doing their thing, and then yeah. Snoop Dogg or whatever, and then fucking some new dude comes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, a, it was a great experience. The whole thing was, like I said, I, I look back on it, and it was all a very good learning experience. And like like we were talking about earlier, I extracted a lot, a lot of value. Right. Yeah, you learn a lesson, certain lessons along the way right there. And hell, even just sharing your story here, there might be somebody listening that's in a creative space that, you know, has a business partner or a creative partner on there that could learn from that as well. Like, hey, read the room. You know what I mean? Like well, everything you're saying, like you said, it was getting weird. So you kind of knew, you know what I mean? Like, it, you know, it wasn't going to be the same anymore, you know? Yeah. That's hard. That's got to be hard too, as a creative person where it's like, man, you, you're finally getting a chance to put, put something out into the world at a large scale and getting some recognition. From what I recall, you guys got some like uh, MTV Asia recognition things like that with with those yeah, albums bbc yeah we got quite a bit of recognition tv all of that considering where we came from and where we started and yeah. you know to this day like there's a pretty large following bro we were like all trying to push we were all pushing it pushing hard, like pushing hard like we were because you remember like staying up late at night pressing cds mm. covers like 300 cities copying them at Getting them ready. Oh, okay. dude. I, that, you know what I mean? When we were recording the second album, I was driving from my house in Oakland to um, Redwood City almost on a daily basis to get the songs mixed in. Mm. I, was, I was going out there every day, spending hours. Just dedicated. Studio, making it perfect. Like with, we had this guy that was mixing and mastering our stuff. And I was, I was every day like out there sitting there like who a, also happened to be a weird ass bitch later on yeah <laughs> sean feels some kind of way about this <laughs> he yeah. just came he's like, just, yo fuck no, that dude <laughs> no it, it, it's fuck that dude but yeah it's like he he came fucked it yeah i was but i was like really he was earning his money with me like i was making sure everything was perfect you're putting his ass to work Everything. I Yo, believe... motherfucker thought he was a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole nother story. But like, I, be... I, my personal belief is like, if you're gonna put something out there into the world, take the time to make it, um, to make it right. That's because you're a right. master. You know any... No, that's a Japanese principle, right? Um... That's, what I think. that's the that's the ninja in him, bro. Yeah, but like, don't put something out that's half baked because once it's out, it's out. Yeah, if it's half big, that ain't shot one. That's a Take call. Time, make it right, you know, and no. like, yeah, Kaizen, Kaizen right? Something like that. Um, that uh, implies the pursuit of perfection. Yeah, that's, steady improvement. Perfectionist. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that goes synonymous with with shot one. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so you get to that point in your creative uh, path, and you know, would you consider that your career at that time? Yeah, that's all I did. That's all For I sure. did. And I, was, I had my, uh, who's now my wife, but I had my girl. She was there. Um, I met her at that time. and So she she's the day me. one. She's day one, yeah, for sure. And Love she it. was helping us pass out flyers. She was uh, in the mix, too. Like, she was, Sean we, knows her. She was, like, always, uh, she yeah. was out there on the streets with us passing flyers, yeah. passing, like, hanging posters, everything, dude. Hell, yeah. yeah. That's good. Had a good takes a it takes a very good team to yeah know. even even my family bro we would stay up late and just prepare everything like from graphics to mm -hmm. printing the making press kits and shipping them mm -hmm. out yeah. label and shit like that mm -hmm. um so when did that chapter in your opinion when did that chapter of your life officially close and and then what was the next chapter that chapter closed it came well okay I think it was hard for me to accept that it was that things had changed to a point where they couldn't be repaired. Um, mm, yeah, it's got to be if it was that personal too, you know. Like you guys were real friends. It was difficult. I 
it was very difficult and I oft, often question myself like could I have done this different could I have done that different yeah and you know and then um you know and then also like you're hearing stuff from people they're like oh he said this or he said that or yeah she said this she said that and it's like I, you know at that time I'm still young I'm still like in my 20s and I'm like yeah. listening to shit instead of yeah, just yeah. focus on my next move right yeah it gets your emo it hijacks your emotions still yeah. you were just saying like these these weirdos be reporting every every, every time you kind of put your story forward motherfuckers come at you like yeah oh you're lying basically yeah yeah and just reporting you bro somebody's reported our, our podcast we're not even talking about that right <laughs> we're just chilling it's like oh yeah it's like it's like damn bro like you you sad. so it's funny because like this i know your podcast obviously is not about daisy music or daisy hip-hop mm. No, no it's Mark Claire. However, Ex accidentally, because we got Mixed Man Sean, you know. Right, but <laughs> because of the subject matter right. for this particular part, uh, you may get people chiming in because the algorithm might get over to well, them. I will then, say this to them hello and good. Yeah. Night. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, here's the thing. Like, I, I want to also say this. Like, I love the Punjabi culture. Of course. And I'm, I'm actually very. It's awesome for me to see how far like Daisy hip hop has come. Yeah. Right. Bro, people it's, see you and they and they love your contribution to it. Yeah. Like they always ask me because it's easier to talk to me than you cuz you're not that much on the media or whatever. Yeah. But they always reach out to me and they always ask me about you and I always tell them, "Bro, he's doing it." Well, make sure you guys take a nice studio picture to put out there. <laughs> yeah, for, uh, I mean, yeah, I yeah. I had a great time while I was doing it, and I and I also got a little taste and understanding of the Punjabi culture, right? So yeah. like, it was cool, cool, man. Like hanging out with Mix and his his mom, she would make like this the, the best food ever, amazing food, and like that's something Josh knows. Really yeah, well. you know what I called it the coma food. She'd be like, oh, oh I, you want I, this I, yogurt? I eat every, all the, that stuff, dude. Give you the yogurt afterwards, and you're just like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back I, in naps, I used to take naps on their floor after eating that food. Oh, yeah. I used to pull up at my apartment, like after school, and my mom be cooking the best. And she would feed both of us, and Josh would get food to come off. He's like, well, We couldn't create anything after eating that food. Like, yeah, yeah. Mom's it was over at that point. Man, I love the, the Punjabi, you know, the food, the people. It's, it's yeah. a amazing culture and yeah, the like, music yeah and and like i would say desi culture in general like all the yeah. all the people i've ever met of um you know indian pakistani afghani background mm -hmm. all been real cool like very just awesome people interesting yeah. very intelligent like i love that those cultures awesome um, hell yeah nice work and and so like i'm really happy to have just somehow like inadvertently become uh, had some kind of impact into their music scene, right? Yeah. So the only thing that get that bothered me after the thing ended is like, I, I wasn't, I didn't care about the money. Like I've made money a thousand other ways, right? Since yeah. the real talk. Yeah. So like that wasn't the issue. Speaking it, of making money, you you helped me make money. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Remember the ringtones and shit like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you know right. I mean? That's right. Okay. Back I, I love helping people shit. make money, too. So, like, <laughs> you know, the thing, like, bro, he's put me in positions where I made money. Like, yeah. We, but, we sold ringtones for, like, $2,200 and shit back yeah. in the days. Like, back in the days, bro. Yeah. When you had a ring back tone? Remember ring back tones? Yeah, yeah we used to. Yeah, yeah, we used to. <laughs> put me on that, bro. Like, yeah. 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 I so, mean, so, always throwing me opportunities you know what i mean to make the money and shit. well that's legit and that's good that always, good that you uh... and that's why bro i've learned a lot from him i consider right. him my mentors i've looked up to him from the music but the when i got to know him we, we slowly became fam bam you know what i mean to right, like got you. to like i don't look at his as uh him as a shot no more to me you know that's my fam. That's that's Seth. Like I know his kids. I know his 
family. Yeah. History and it goes deeper than just oh, I can make beats. Look at me, I'm talented. <laughs> that whole yeah. fuck your little poetry, fuck your little shit you're talking about, bro. Been there, done it, heard it all. Yeah, but I haven't I got you. Anything. So for Seth, then you were saying that it, it wasn't about the money, but so if it was, what was the most important thing of that time for you? Um, at that time, and still is in terms of that chapter in my life, <clears throat> is our our legacy, mine and Ra's, right? Right. Legacies will forever be intertwined, right? No doubt. You cannot tear that apart because that's already in the past. It's already happened. Yeah, it can't be erased. Um, but for me, it's like if that story is going to be told, you have to tell it truthfully. You can't leave a major part of that legacy out because you're doing a disservice to not only the people who follow you, but you're also doing a disservice to yourself because right, yeah. it's part of your legacy. You can't, yeah, yeah. Like, you have to be truthful about how this all came about. Where that makes the story better anyways. It's a great story. It's yeah. a great, story. but I understand like there's an image you have to uphold, right? Like people, mm -hmm. think you're, uh, uh, people might see you in a certain light and they're like, uh, yeah, oh, like, you know, they look up to you because of certain things that they write, that they perceive you as having done or whatever. Yeah. But the truth is like credibility in a way. Here's the truth. Man. Truth is like, we're at a certain age. Okay. Well, I can speak for myself. Oh, I appreciate it. We're at a certain age where at least I believe this as a man, I take responsibility for every action that I do, right? Including right. what, including how I present myself to the public, right? I take responsibility for that, even if it ends up working against me and backfiring. Right. Just keeping it authentic. I'm a man. I, yeah. I make my own decisions and I take responsibility for the, uh, for, for the repercussions, if there are any, right? Right. So when you're putting yourself, he, we're about the same, he's a little younger, but we're about the same age, right? Right. You're, Putting, if you have a large following and you got people that look up to you and they want to know, like, how they want to know that story, they do know a certain story. Yeah. They At, there's going to come a point where, like, you have to, your legacy must be told, right? So when you tell that, make sure you tell the truth. What happened? How did it all begin? Who, See, that's the whole who, thing. Who was there? Like, how did this idea ever come about? Who was there, like, you know, um, helping this thing start as an, a, an inception in your mind and then turn it to something real? Yeah, it's an inspiration. Right? Where did the inspiration come from? What was the motivation? What was the, yeah, I mean, you're, that's the integral part of the story that gets the momentum going. You're providing space, you're recording, you know what I mean? You're mixing, you're mastering, you're doing yeah. There's a lot more to it, but we don't have, it would take us two weeks to go through everything. You're making the... <laughs> well, I think, I mean, you got the core of, of the story going, uh, gone uh, out there pretty well. If there's, uh, what would you say then in this chapter of your life, what is the big thing? Now, I know you were with your, your day one all the way through to yeah. now, and you guys have grown your family. So... What's Seth into? What are you guys getting into? Uh, where are you finding joy and passion? And, um, you know, what's what's the main thing now? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'm, I'm going to say this because it connects to uh, this. Uh, I'm going to say this because it connects to where I am today, right? Got you. So after that incident, <clears throat> the next chapter began in my life, in my story, in my book. Mm -hmm. And it was a dark chapter, really dark. So my, not too long after we, so we're going through that, like I said, that loss, right? Yeah. I was dark. I started, I took a job at this place, right? And I started, cause I, I'm like, okay, I got to start making some money some other way. I'm making money and then I get laid off. Fuck, all right. I got this lawsuit. I just got laid off. I don't know what the fuck to do with myself. I just put seven years into this music thing and now it's like no longer, all of a sudden it's like a, like my, my girl left me, you know, mm. 
then my mother gets, like I said, she always had a lot of health Bro, issues. For something you put in so much work and you can't even put your name on it. Like, they, yeah. won't, they won't let you. Yeah. But again, that goes back to that whole, like, you know, certain men will react certain ways. Right. For sure. I would put the I would a, a weird ass bitch is gonna be a weird ass bitch. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, no but, for real. Um but I you know, so I and then also my mother, um she was she was very ill and so she finds out that she's got cancer, right? And so she's like, but it's not like it was like, you know, it was uh malignant, right? So gotcha. she, she's only got like six months to live you know keep in mind this is the woman that i told you she raised me right, right. Uh, by this time my dad had remarried he had three sons uh with his second wife whom who i'm very close to they're i could they're my half brothers but i just refer to them as my brothers yeah of course very cool individuals. I, i'm much older than them right yeah I, like 15 I said, years he said right <laughs> but they're like like i love them to death right and, you know, me and my dad kind of rekindled our, we had some weird shit going on, but we rekindled. And um, <clears throat> anyways, she, uh, so my mom's sick. I'm out of a job. You know, I'm, I'm in this lawsuit with this dude that, you know, I considered a friend, very close friend. We were doing and, the same job, right? Um, no, I think that was, it was around that time, but it was a little after. And, and, um. So she dies. So my mom dies, and mm. um, and I'm just in this real fucking dark place, man. The only person keeping me afloat is my girl. Yeah. Right? My day one. And so I'm just like, I honestly, after my mom died, I I felt weird. Like I felt like I wasn't connected to the earth anymore. Like I would, mm -hmm. she was my anchor. Now my anchor's gone. I'm just floating, floating around. You know. And then, but so right before she died, right, I remember I took her to this, took her, I, I basically, while she was sick, I had this, it was weird because like, it was a terrible time, but I had this moment of clarity. I remember I was like, um, all of a sudden I knew what was important, right? Like I thought that music thing was important. I thought me proving that I should own half of my music was important. I thought, you know, uh, making money was important. I thought uh, me somehow like, um, like, you know, getting vengeance on what had happened was important. Right. But when, but when she was sick and I was the only caretaker, right? Cause I'm her only son. Right. And mm -hmm. her brothers and sisters, she, they, none of them really helped out. So it was just me. I remember, and, and I remember my, that time. And my girl. And my girl. I can't. And yeah, my yeah. now wife, right? She. We were the only ones. And so I was spending a lot of time with my mom, but my mindset was different. I had always spent time with her, but now I'm knowing that I only have a few months left with her. That's it. After that, I will never see her again. So I'm spending time with her, and I'm cherishing every moment. It's just special. Yeah. And I'm realizing I'm like, this is what matters. Mm. Keep around the people that you love, that love you back, where there's no conditions. You're not worried about how you look. How yep. you you're not worried about what you say. You're not worried about um, what they think of you, what you think of them. There's no mistrust. Like, these are the people that you truly, this is what matters. And I had this very distinct moment of clarity where I'm like, I don't give a I'm yep. like, I do not give a fuck about all that other shit. Of course, I'm not going to just stop pursuing it. But it's like, I, it was just like, 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 God told me, this voice just told me, like, this is what matters, you know? Right. Clarity. So, so that, so I remember I took her out to lunch, my mom, right? Mm -hmm. And she's, in, by this time, she's in a wheelchair. She can't walk. I took her down the street. We went out to lunch and then. I said, Mom, you know, like, I, you know, I felt bad because I had never, I, I still didn't have kids yet, right? And right. she always wanted to be a grandmother. And I'm like. <clears throat> she named your daughter, right? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, 
if I ever have kids someday, and she's knowing like she's going to be gone any day now, right? Right. She's like, I'm like, if I ever have kids someday, you know, what, do you have a name? And she gave me the name right away. She didn't hesitate. Mm. It was a Japanese name, and it means, it, it means, it's like a female name for a girl. Right. And it, it's a very specific meaning. It's like a, it's like a girl who's born in spring. Beautiful. And and then, you know, time goes by, a few months pass, and she passes away. And then wife goes pregnant. Damn. What? Life is a symphony like that. So nine months later, the baby is born. It's a girl, and it's spring. It's springtime. Damn. See? And I, we knew what she was going to be named, you know? And, like, it's spring now. Shout out to yeah, your daughter. Yeah. She's awesome. She's That's now true. she's now almost fifteen. She's gonna be fifteen next month. But mm. you know, son, it, what it son's did, around there. Yeah. So teenagers. You know how fast it goes by, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole nother but anyways, that leads me to the chapter that I'm in now. Yeah, for sure. Um, where like I said, I learned what's important without question. Yeah. Without question. I know what I stand for, you know, and um, I also learned not to give a fuck, dude. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in an irresponsible way. I'm very responsible, but I don't care about the little stuff. Like it doesn't bother me. Like mm -hmm. there are things that are gonna make me happy, gonna make me sad, gonna make my life a little bit of a roller coaster. But the truth is, right. I don't care what's important. To me. Yeah. And there's nothing that can change that, you know? And yeah, so that's, you know. That's that where you're at. So I came out of the dark, you know? And yeah, that's good. And you had that, you had that to center you and, you know, that's pretty, pretty powerful. A lot of things happening all at once. And then your life changes all of a sudden in many ways, uh, both professionally and personally with the loss of your mother. And then the birth of your child, and boom, that's, it'll take you down and lift you up real quick. Real quick, man. And I have two children now, so yeah. I have a son who's 10, who's amazing too, both of them. Yeah. Both of them incredible. Dang, man. Yeah. Like, kind of weird. We were getting busy around the same time because my kids are around the same age, <laughs> okay. uh, 16 and 13. <laughs> boy, you got one. Both boys. boys. Yeah, both boys. See, I had a bunch of sisters growing up, so God was like, yo. I got you. <laughs> I do have a little brother too. It's good, man. Yeah, I got one little brother, and well, you know, you know, life is like that. You, it hands you a, a nice little mixture to kind of teach you things in in life. And I was the oldest one as well, so yeah, that that perspective of of um, shifting hey, into par shifts into parenting, it'd be like that sometimes. Yeah. Josh, Sean, what up? Remember. Uh... Your younger son. This is some of the most Marcus. Poetic, yeah. yeah, most poetic shit I ever heard. He's the comedian. His son goes. He's like, it sucks when you fall in love with your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's like a damn. He be coming oh, out with shit. Like your little dude over hey, here. that's like, like a Seneca quote right there, man. Right? Yeah, almost. This dude, he he's watched like The Simpsons, like yeah. all seasons of The Simpsons, at least five times. Yeah, good taste. There's like 30 seasons. That's like, that's so many, that's so many episodes of Simpsons. Yeah. That's why he's a comedian. When they lock onto something, yeah. they'll, do, they'll, they'll stay there for a while, man. Yeah. So go. your daughter's into the piano. What about uh, your son? He's actually very musical too. Like he makes beats and stuff and he loves, he picks up on, like he'll be playing random songs. Like yeah. in the car, he'll be like, Hey, can you play? Because um, we have this, like, you know, you just hit the button and you tell it what to play, and he'll be like, "Hey, you know, play," and he'll just say some random stuff, and it's just some song that like no one's heard, but somehow he <laughs> found it. Like, yeah, it's pretty dope. I'm like, and I always say, like, "What do you like about this song?" You know, because I want to, yeah. I want to. He's like, "Oh, I like that one sound. It just keeps repeating. It's like that beeping sound, or I like how it starts out." And I'm like, "That's yeah. called." And yeah. I'm like. That's that beeping sound. That's like a, or that that's actually a. That's not a beeping sound. That's like a hi hat. Mm. You know, 
I like that, you know, or that buzzing sound. Oh yeah, that's so he's it. picking it apart. Yeah, he's picking yeah. it apart, and he, he likes producer mind. Very yeah. things about certain songs, you know. And yeah. I'm like, I, I really love that, you know. So I try to foster that and try to get our stories ready. are their stories too. You know what I mean? So like, it's good. You never know what happens uh, in life, but if our kids can look at our story and and learn anything from it. I think that helps them on their path to, you know, hopefully they pay attention. I wasn't paying attention all the time, but I know that I learned things from my parents and my uncles, my aunties, and my friends, the community and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. I think that, I think that's kind of like a perspective that a lot of people have, but maybe don't acknowledge it in a, I guess in an overt kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what keeps us going, you know? Yeah, I think it's important too, like you said, your aunts and your uncles, and you know, if, if the extended you family, other um, adult influences in your life, I think that can make you a more well-rounded individual. You know, yeah, a, if you're fortunate enough to have it like that, you know, not everybody is, but I think we make families too, you know, in different ways. Our friends, groups, our circles shape us a little bit, you know. How is your perspective on this? Um, having talked about that, obviously, Sean's still in your circle. But how do you determine who's in your circle nowadays? What do you, what value are you looking at? And like, um, I know for me, I, I try to keep it pretty tight. I'm open with everybody, but I'm like, I'm mm. a person, I'm a personal, but like, not be a little bit Shh. promises and commitments and anything like that. I keep it real tight. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I look. I mean, I'm always open to like to meeting people and, and building bridges. Like when yeah. I was young, I used to burn bridges. Yeah. For no reason. I would just burn bridges. <laughs> uh, as I got older, I started building bridges. And I'm very, like, I, I always, I always like to, when I meet someone, I, I know that we're going to have a different perspective of life, right? A different, like, viewpoint, different opinions. We're, we're just two different people, right? But yeah. I want to, I want to give them a chance and, like, understand where they're coming from and, and, like at the end of the day, we're all just, uh, we're all just human beings. Like one of my favorite books is, um, it's called the laws of human nature. Mm. I recommend that to so many people, but nobody actually reads it. The, shit. <laughs> the laws of human nature. I'm going to look it up. All right, Jaime, get on there. Oh, that's who got a lot of books. Robert green. Is Robert green. Of, oh, 48 laws of power. Yeah. He's one of the most yeah. underrated, most important, um, thinkers and researchers of our time people don't realize that they don't give him enough credit but he is true he is a great thinker and you know that book bro 48 laws of power yeah listen to it and the type of ruthless ways he's teaching mm -hmm. i feel like the homie acted upon that shit like like oh okay yeah i mean well so what he's doing is he's exposing um traits that exist in uh, all human beings right but yeah like in the 48 laws of power he does that but that's more of a very extreme example right but mm -hmm. in the laws of human nature he uh sort of uh, one of the main themes of that book is like narcissism right which i do think is a popular term that is um uh, misused around a lot Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Because it's a, it's a very fancy way of like accusing somebody of being a certain way, or yeah. So what but, did they, what did he say in the book about it? So he he, um. So we are all we are all a little bit narcissistic, right? It's just part of facts. You know, but most of us at a certain age, like we learn to control it, or we learn to understand the difference between like being narcissistic and and, and or it's. Uh, acting on a from a narcissistic, you know, standpoint, and sort of like being able to draw back and say, "Okay, wait a second. Like, let me consider this other person's feelings as well." Right. Most yeah. Adults can do that. Yeah. Self that self awareness part. There are certain people that just get deeper and deeper into that narcissism, right? They they become called yeah. a deep narcissist, and uh, he. Uh, that's not all the book is about. It's, it's really about what it's titled, which is the laws of human nature, how humans mm -hmm. behave and, you know, where does it stem from? Like he says, like a lot of it stems from like 
um, childhood experiences or maybe childhood trauma or just things that happened in your childhood that shaped yeah. your beliefs and views of the world. Um, but back to sort of connecting that to what you were saying, like my yeah. circle, um, I kind of understand like, okay, and like, I'm not some like bodhisattva where I like, I have all world knowledge or something, but like, <laughs> but I, um, I do not yet. <laughs> understand that like a lot of us you know what what this new what this person this new person in my life may may think is like normal or good or you know like how you're supposed to behave or whatever what's just normal to them might be completely way different than what i think right their mm -hmm. their perspective of life might be way different than mine so i understand that so i'm not going to just immediately try and judge them like oh, I don't like that dude because he said this or that, or I don't like her because she was looking at me like this weird way. You know, right. I try to give them a little bit of a chance, you know, and just try to get to know them if I can, if they're if you know circumstances allow that. And so, yeah. like, I'm always open to bringing people into my circle. As far as my inner circle, yeah, uh, that consists of. So, I have, I have a, a few very close friends. But one of them, who was basically my best friend, was like my brother, he died two years ago. Mm. Actually, two years ago, July 6th, he died, uh, July 6th, 2022. Damn. And so that messed me up pretty bad. Like, uh, he was only, you know, in his 40s. And he passed away. He left a young son, you know, who he Damn. didn't really get to know, which was very, very sad. And um, Damn. I had that discussion with him, actually, about, because he was there when my mom was sick. He was there like, hey, man, if you need anything, let me know. He was like that, you know, right there. Right on. We had a discussion. I remember saying like, bro, I kind of learned. I think he asked me like, what did, did you, like, how do you feel? You know, and I'm like, you know what? I, I feel okay. Like, I learned to not give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> what? what you, oh, you fuck? And I said, it's hard to explain, but like, I just yeah. don't. He thought I was like, I know, like Tupac and Juice or something. Like I don't give a fuck, you know. <laughs> like no, no, no. You know, it's just now like, we're gonna ride down the street shooting everybody now. <laughs> it's just, you know, like I you know what I am crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember having that discussion with him, and then uh, you know, towards the end of his life, uh, we had another discussion. I don't know. Yeah, I remember. He told me, you know, like, you know. He, we kind of got into that and it was a kind of a nice uh, discussion that we had. Yeah. But, but when, you know, when he passed away, it, it kind of like messed up the, the, the inner circle. You know yeah. what I mean? No, I got you for sure. So when someone like when the glue is not there, you, you don't stick yeah. together as well. Yeah. The presence, the absence of a, a strong presence is, is if it's very powerful, noticeable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was like, definitely a strong presence. Like definitely very intelligent, uh, charismatic, very uh, smart, funny person. To, so to have that not there anymore, it's weird, you know? Yeah. My inner circle is now is really, and of course, Mix is like part of my inner circle, but we just, he's doing his thing, I'm doing mine. We don't. Oh, yeah. Often, but like my inner circle is just really my family. Like that's, that's the chapter I'm in now in my life. It's like of my course. is on my family. I want to be the best father and husband that I can find. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a good place to be, you know, having gone through everything you went through and having your family there for you and it just gives you that purpose, that, that, that center of gravity, something for you to focus on. And then, um, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to that, but when you were talking about not giving a fuck, this yeah. thing was going to my mind. I used to get upset about the way people would sit, uh, reactions and, you know, their opinions and you name it. Yeah. Now I just laugh. I literally laugh. It's like some dumb shit happens. And I'm like, what the? F and I just laugh my ass off. And then people were like, I'm glad you can laugh about that. <laughs> like, <laughs> these are like coworkers and shit. Cause it's like, every time you turn around, somebody's doing some dumb shit. What are you going to do? Be pissed off all the time. I ain't got time for that. I don't got time for it. No, man. Like, 
life is short, man. Just enjoy it. You know? Yeah. So I just laugh at people like that. And then like people come in all super serious. I'm going to fight you. I'm like, I just laugh at them all like, go, okay, <laughs> let's go then. <laughs> like, it ain't worth it, man. It ain't worth it at all. And like want, wanting to fight about every little issue is just, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it's so much work. Like it's so much work to be upset about shit all the time and like out Maybe. on the hunt like that. You know what I mean? Those people are out on the hunt. I don't care what anybody says. Anybody's that that's that upset about every little thing, they're looking for it. They are absolutely looking for it. Oh yeah, man. Like you know, I, I read this quote that's like I think I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, um, you know, when you're when you're too focused on like um someone else's downfall or just like getting revenge or just so something you don't like about somebody the quote was something like uh um you're you're drinking poison hoping that the other person dies mm. and i mean i'm i'm messing it up it was some it was something similar to that but the whole point is like you're mulling over this person you're angry at them you're hoping something bad happens to them but in the meantime they don't know yeah and, but but you're like internalizing all this negative energy. You're only poisoning yourself. Facts. It's like, hey, okay, maybe they did you wrong. Maybe if you see them, it's on site. Maybe you're gonna do something. <laughs> like, but why would you sit there and mull over it? Why are you gonna yeah. sit and when you could be doing something productive? Facts. Yeah. No doubt. Well, boys, this has been a good conversation. But you know, we always do. You know, we always do in every episode that we have a conversation. We always uh, do a key takeaways. So as the guest of honor, Seth, if you have anything from our discussion that, you know, really jogged your memory, um, that's going to stick with you or, or any message that you have for anybody that was brave enough to stick with us to the end. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, hopefully you got some value out of this. I know I was pretty long winded. But uh, um, I think it's because I don't really go on many podcasts or <laughs> I don't have a big social media presence or anything. So I saw this as a good opportunity to just have a really uh, cool discussion. For sure. So hopefully, um, anyone who is still around watching uh, that you, you know, took something out of this that you find valuable, you know, and I appreciate it. Hell yeah. Big Sean, what you got, man? Um, we just got started. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there's there's so much more we can we can hear from my brother. Of course. And uh, I don't think that, that there's ever going to be enough time. But I uh, feel lucky to be able to just call him. Be like, yeah, bro. Uh, have you on a thing? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I'm just blessed. I could I could always. Always call a shop or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Whenever time and um, and he uh he definitely is a legend. In the game, his 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 work like speaks for itself, and I was like um, I'm a fan of of his like creativity overall, like his life is art. You know, um, uh, the music he created was impactful. The graphics he still does. Like his visual work, his graffiti, it's like it's out of this world, bro. Like, um, it's just trippy for me to be in the presence of like a that type of a creative mind, and I I consider myself blessed, you know. Hell yeah! Just to be here, you know what I mean? In this time, in this moment, just to just just to be here, bro. Like twenty twenty four, like I'm I'm here with you guys, breathing the same air. Um, I, um, I don't know who, like, you know, that's my dog. I love him like that. I'm always going to love him. And, uh, I, you know, we, we grew closer over the years. The shit we done is a uh, hell of legendary. It's, it's Bay Area as fuck. It's like, it couldn't have happened nowhere else. It had to be on this soil. Yeah. Uh, and, um. It ain't over, you know what I mean? So I'm still fucking excited. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta keep the energy up. <laughs> yeah, I'm still excited as like the, the, the first time that I came around and met these guys. Like, 
bro, this is, it, it, you know, Einstein, whatever, of that caliber of a brain. Yeah. And you, you got to love it, bro. I mean, shit. I mean, I'm, I'm always going to learn from you. I'm always going to have that respect for you. And uh, always going to try to hear what the fuck you cook in. Always trying to be part of your projects. Always, you know, keep me around, bro. Like, um, life is beautiful like this. <laughs> when you're with your family, with your people you love, you can learn, learn from. This is, this is not like a waste of time. This is, a, for me, a conversation with Shah is the equivalent of a fucking Stanford degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the dissertation. <laughs> yeah, love it, know, love it. I'm, I'm blessed. This is, the dude's the institution, bro. This is a library. This is encyclopedia. <laughs> I can ask him a hell of shit that I don't understand. I don't know. And, uh. It's nice to have a you know big bro like that. Yeah, no doubt. Follow me like yo, do nothing. Pull up, no questions asked. Like he's here. <laughs> you know I mean? Into the wee know. hours of the night in the makeshift podcast studio. <laughs> yeah, and we we always link up. This is the first time it's been recorded. Yeah, legit. You know, we get food. He come. You know, we do not that much music. We do family stuff. Gotta yeah. love it. And uh, this this episode is. Short as fuck. Yeah, dude, it's our shortest one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's definitely our longest one. And that's a good thing. Um hey, I'll sure. can, I can can I jump in? All right. I got a good key takeaway for sure, for sure. Um this uh, to me the reason the Seneca quote of no man uh, gets wise by chance is this exact thing. When you have relationships, even new ones or ones that are far out and I can hear your story, right? Like I'm listening to your story. I had my questions I wanted to ask and had fun, you know, with uh, Sean jumping in with his experiences and how you guys met and how it all came together and listening to that stuff. It's just a, you get to know people in a lot more intimate way when you stop everything else and you legitimately listen to their story. So if anything, I appreciate you being vulnerable, coming on the show and talking about your story because you said you shared some heavy hitters that a lot of people keep, you know, behind the armor. So they don't want they don't want to put that kind of business out there, which means a lot. I mean, if anybody's first getting introduced to who you are and uh, through our show or or to either of us, then you know they're really going to get an authentic piece of who you are, and I think that's important. But even to keep friendships and relationships like this alive. I think that's a good note and a good takeaway from uh, what this podcast can bring and these kind of relationships can bring. Um, if you're going to, to take the time to record things like this and put it out there for people to listen to, that's, that's what's on my mind. And that would be way, my key takeaway. Nobody else, nobody else has this. Like, because Shao doesn't do interviews. He doesn't do appearances. People always want to hear from him. Well, then they might be knocking on your door. <laughs> yeah. it, it is a blessing. It, it, yeah. it, it's a blessing to document this. And uh, I'm trying to do more. As well, you, keep going. The conversation ain't over. <laughs> like, and that was something else, too. I was like, you know, Seth, if you want to come back anytime. Yeah, anytime. sure. I mean, I mean, you know, there's lot more to that story and there's a lot more just uh in general there's yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just life yeah and just being from from the bay well you know how we talk we our 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 show is based on three things people uh the planet and progress right so we're looking at where's the innovations where are the ideas um people's stories what they're into and then you know that international piece like you know we're all from different places the impacts that we make are interconnected across the thing. So that's what our idea of the show is all about. So if you want to come on with a topic or an idea like that as a guest in the future, again, just let us know, man. So the door is always open. Right on. Sure. Bro, there's yeah. something in the, in the water, in the bay, like, um, being in here, just soaking this energy and just breathing this air. 
It makes you creative like this guy. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bay Area water. Some, some, yeah. some. I wouldn't drink that Bay water, though. <laughs> I mean, have you guys ever swam in the bay i know this is we're, we're gonna jump right into some weird shit real quick before we close this out no have you hell no <laughs> but i, no, I don't i don't, I don't swim would, in the public <laughs> first of all that shit scares the shit out of me no it's uh, old and there's sharks in there yeah exactly but they do like the people that swim from alcatraz all the way to san francisco and stuff i'm like hell no that'll never be me like clay thompson you know clay thompson on the warriors you know, he's the boat captain, so he'd be out in the bay, jumping in the bay and shit. I'm like, oh, dude, calm down, bro. You got a whole, you got to win us another championship. Calm down. What are you doing? Have yeah, you yeah. seen Alcatraz, the movie? <laughs> you already lost one Achilles on the court. We can't be losing it in the bay. Yeah, yeah. That, I've been in a boat in the bay, like a little fishing boat, and it was, it was real choppy. Like, mm -hmm. Old and choppy. It was not a uh, very uh, comfortable body of water. Be. Yeah. I don't play with water, man. It's too, yeah. too dangerous. You know, the world is a small place. I found this was interesting. Uh, where I'm living down here now is called the South Bay. It's the L.A. area, South Bay, you know, her, uh, all the way from El Segundo down to here. That's what they call it. And it's all, all kinds of little towns. So I went from the Bay Area to the South Bay. It's a weird world. <laughs> but I'm still in Cali. <laughs> all right, boys. Let's go ahead and wrap this thing up, man. Seth, again, appreciate you coming up on the show, um, sharing your story. I absolutely would love to have you come back as soon as you can, uh, maybe all three of us in person, if it's on Zoom, if you guys want to repeat how you did it here. Whatever way it happens, man, come on back. Uh, bring a topic, share some more stories with us. We'd love to have you. For and sure. uh, you, know what, you know what it is. When we come in on the show, always telling those kind of stories and have a little bit of fun and uh, putting it out there for people to have a good time on the drive or in the gym, wherever they're at. So, all right, then we're going to wrap this episode up. And like we say all the time, protect your heart, protect your mind. Sean, what else they got to protect? Protect your pin number till the next episode. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> all right, man. Hey, hit one of those buttons real quick. I don't care. Uh, let's get it. Oh. We're out. Peace. <laughs>